Kodo Odo, November 27, 2018. Rise for the pledge. pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hello, my name is Akshara Iyer. I was homeschooled before I came to Worcester in second grade, and I loved the school environment. Mrs. Cohen, my second grade teacher, went an extra mile to help me adjust to school life. In third grade, I went into the challenge program with Mrs. Liz Santucci, and it was very fun. Two weeks before third grade started, my dad fell terribly ill, which caused him to go to the hospital for many months. My third grade teacher, Mrs. Jessica Georgie, helped me go through this tough phase like a parent would. Many people asked my mom if she was going to take me to a child psychologist, but she said, no, between her school family and our real family, she's getting all the emotional support she needs. One time, I had a challenge project that required parent assistance, but since my parents were still unable to help, my challenge teacher, Mrs. Santucci, took me to her house, and she and her husband helped me complete my project. This has become an unforgettable memory for me. My family will also never forget the kind gesture of Mrs. Santucci in making two large containers of veggie soup using a special recipe the day my dad was supposed to get discharged after seven months of being in the hospital. At all times, I feel that the teachers and staff are keeping an eye out for my well-being, and I am thankful for that. Worcester Elementary is a great place to be, no matter how old you are, and I look forward to going to school every day. We have an amazing special area rooms, like the gymnasium, art room, library, music room, and playground, and I love them all. Our wolf pack meetings, otherwise known as assemblies, are one of the things that define Worcester. We get to meet Wolfie, our school mascot, and do fun activities like skits and plays or watching something from the movie player. We also do an assembly at the beginning of the year to introduce our school theme. Our staff is very important to our school's environment. Our teachers are very fun and nice, and they make learning awesome. They help shape our minds for life. Our lunch ladies monitor the cafeteria and help kids during lunchtime. The janitors clean the school so it's not messy all the time. Our nurse takes care of us, like giving cough drops and band-aids when we need them and making sure to call our parents when we are sick. Worcester also has activities before, during, and after school. There's orchestra, band, and a chorus group. We also have after school sports and chess club, just to name a few. My family and I are going to India for my dad's further treatment in two weeks. I wish I didn't have to leave school and go. I will miss everyone here, the staff, teachers, and my friends, particularly my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Judy Macy, but I hope I can stay in touch with everyone from India. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great night and happy holidays.
Thank you, junior school board members. Um, and just for the, uh, uh, the, the, the notice here this evening, um, I'm sorry, you, it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Uh, the public is hereby advised of the audio and video recording of this meeting for the purposes of rebroadcasting. Um, this was a previously provided executive session announcement. It was provided at the November 5th Education Committee meeting, but um, just for clarification, I guess, an executive session of the board was held on October 29th, 2018 for the purposes of, one, reviewing and discussing matters related to school safety, two, consulting with our attorney regarding information and strategy in connection with the lawsuit captioned SWD 101 LLC and WNR 38 LLC, versus Monco Board of Appeals, docket number 2006-31345 in the Court of Common Pleas for Montgomery County, and three, holding an information and strategy session related to the Joint Labor Management Committee with the Methacton Education Association. By way of attendance, we have all of our board members here this evening, Mr. Navarrete remote. Uh, recognition of guests and scheduled speakers, I turn it back to Dr. Zerby. Now I think it's my turn. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, this evening we have a number of uh, presentation and guests here, uh, but, but first of all, uh, just a change on the agenda real quick. We have some uh, high school band students that are uh, interested in getting back to practice, but are here this evening for a special presentation. So I do ask uh, Methacton Education, uh, the, oh, Mr. Bean, there, there you are. Uh, the, the Education Foundation uh, to come forward, uh, Mr. Bean, President, and Nikki Grelovich, uh, Executive Director for a presentation. Thank you, Dr. Zerby, Madam President, fellow school, well, not fellow, but school board members. Um, it's my distinct privilege to be here again tonight for another check presentation. As you know, the Methacton Education Foundation exists to raise money to help support our wonderful students and faculty throughout the Methacton School District. And tonight, we're going to do this once again. Uh, tonight's check is for the is sum of $3,650, and it's split in basically into two different areas. One is to allow uh, all of our science teachers in the district to have members in the Montgomery County Science Teachers Association. This provides them with access to professional development resources to enhance science in their classrooms. And the balance of the check tonight is to support our wonderful marching band as they go down to Memphis, Tennessee at the end of December to participate in the Liberty Bowl. So, as you can see, we have a number of band members who are here, and it's, I think it's terrific that they're here tonight. And so I'm going to ask them to come down, and any science teachers who may be here, you're probably going to look at, you'll be, uh, I'll be able to tell because you're going to be a little bit older than they are, but come on down and we'll do this uh, check presentation, okay? Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Beam and Ms. Krelovich for your support of the, uh, of the uh, school district. And um, it now gives me uh, a great pleasure to uh, recognize uh, two of our, our um, excellent staff. Uh, basically, every month we recognize uh, staff in the Methacton School District with the recognition of excellence. And uh, the certificate that they receive uh, says the following, you have been recognized by your colleagues for excellence in serving the students, faculty, staff, and community of the Methacton School District. And this evening we have Ms. Brucker, principal at Worcester Elementary School here to help us recognize two that we, that we are recognizing from uh, Worcester for the Award of Excellence. Ms. Brucker. Good evening. It gives me great honor to highlight the professionalism that these two individuals share with us on a daily basis. Ms. Sarah Wright is our emotional support teacher, and I have never met someone so flexible, calm in any situation, and can speak the language of children and parents and teachers, any school staff, all at the same time while controlling a situation. Uh, she loves every one of her kids the exact same as every one of her own family members. And she gives and gives of herself every day. Uh, she never puts herself first, which makes me have to track her down to make sure she's eating a lot of times. She has lunch bunches with kids, so she knows a lot more than uh, most of us about a lot of things because of the expertise of our students and at the same time she gives our staff the role models that they need and how to work with our kids every day no matter the situation so it is my pleasure to celebrate Sarah Wright tonight And not to be outdone, Ms. Anita, Mrs. Anita Massey, um, she is also a very flexible person. She is an instructional assistant with our K-1-2 learning support classroom. She is everywhere we need her to be. She is a former Catholic school teacher, so her expertise that she brings with us, she has those expectations for students that are very high and they reach them. She also has that look that says, that's not a good idea, and they stop, which is a gift to have. <laughs> and Anita never says no. Anita, can you cover breakfast this morning? Anita, can you go out to recess for us? She is always there for us. She is willing to help students and guide them and give them the moral values that we're looking for and what's right and what's wrong and, and talking with kids. So again, it is my pleasure to celebrate Mrs. Anita Massey. Thank you, Ms. Brucker. Uh, next on the agenda, it's my pleasure to introduce science teacher, Mr. Savitz from the high school. He is here to present uh, the Methacton High School Hackathon. 
And I, if I would, uh, if everyone would be so kind, um, they have a presentation they'd like to show on the screen. So if the board members could take their seat in the front row, we'd appreciate that. Okay, welcome. Uh, this is a great collaboration. It started really with Dr. Katona sending me an email and said, hey, you may be interested in this. And then when I read what the hackathon was about and the lantern fly, I then talked to um, Mr. Sawyer, who's our AP uh, computer science teacher, and I said, maybe we can do a little collaboration between my students in AP Environmental and your computer science students. So we found four that crossed over. Well, three of his students were in his class and then another one of my students, not in computer science, but owns a farm and was very interested in being a part of the lantern fly research, made the team. So they're going to show you what they did at a competition at the IU, trying to develop an app to educate the public and to also follow the migration of the lantern fly. Hi, my name is Zoe LaPaglia, and I'm one of the um, team members here. Um, so what the whole point of this was really, you probably have seen the spotted lantern flies like all over. It's an invasive species and it's taking over. Um, it originally came from Asia and it's come over here. It came over here um, by shipping, like it was transferred off of one, someone's um, like just their boards or something. So it came over here by accident and then it just took over. And because it's killing so many of the essential plants and like it's um, destroying all the crops that we need and it's, it has a very big impact on our um, economy here, especially in Pennsylvania. So um, we wanted to, in the hackathon, we thought it was really interesting because we were able to create an app so we can um, track the migration of this species and hopefully we'll know where they're going to be going and hopefully um, be able to get rid of them. <laughs> All righty. All right, uh, hi, my name is Joe Massey Antonio. Um, I am one of the computer science students that uh, Mr. Sawyer and Mr. Savage selected to be working on the Lanternfly uh, Hackathon. And here's a picture of the four of us working. This was at the uh, IEU, I think. MC, M MC that's my bad. Uh, <laughs> the MCIU um, in Montgomery County. And pretty much what we did, it was a six hour uh, span of time where we had to work to create an application that could be used for uh, tracking the lantern fly and reporting it. And the idea was to appeal to as many people as possible and to expedite the process of reporting lantern flies because this is something that um, they need data on. And for them to acquire that data, it needs to be convenient and easy for people to do. Um, here's a slide of us presenting. And uh, this is the actual app presentation. So we're going to show it to you and move through all of it. Is that like the? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's not up. No, that's that's you gotta click the link. No. Escape? Is it is it already up? Escape. You're trying to get that URL right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'll see if I can help you. There's a certain level of irony. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I try. All right, so it's formatted to fit mobile, so it's a little, uh, we have to shrink it down a little bit. So if you could just hit the frame right there, that should, uh, <laughs> that should be about good, thank you. Um, so as you can see, that is the fly itself, and the idea is to present it right in the front screen, so it's something that everyone has the image of it burned into their mind, so whenever they see it, they'll know to report it. Uh, the first section that we're gonna talk about is the life section, or life stages. And uh, if either uh, Julia or Steven would like to talk about that. Scroll down to yeah, the top. Sure. Oh yeah, you can, you can enlarge this too. So this web page, uh, this uh, page of the app um, talks about the stages of the lanternfly and the, the four of them being the egg mass stage, the two nymph stages and the adult stage. Uh, it just lets you know how to identify those stages and this diagram here below also shows you the times of the year that they go through the stages, which will help you with uh, how you deal with the, the problem of the lanternflies. And uh, now you can return to the home section via that little bar at the bottom. And uh, there are other sections, including information on uh, the history of the lanternfly, where it came from, and the other information section, as well as information on the lanternfly itself, as well as the dubbed tree of heaven that they uh, tend to inhabit. And uh, that is another invasive species that um, the lanternflies arrived here with. and it's contributing to the problem because it allows them to spread and lay their eggs. And uh, there's some diagram, or not diagrams, pictures, you know what I mean. Um, but you can return back to the home section, actually. And there's also a section called solutions, which involves various measures that the everyday person can take to help combat the land and fly issue. Julia, you want to talk about that? So, um, for possible solutions, what we can do is planting milkweed, which Zoe found out, um, which is harmful, it's toxic to dogs and horses, but it also is very toxic to the lantern flies. So, if the lantern flies were to eat it and you put it in an area that's like, like basically like a cornfield where like dogs or horses wouldn't be, then that would be very effective. And also, there's this thing called tree banding. And what tree banding is, is it's, there are different levels of like stickiness um, to get each stage of the lantern flag because there are four stages so as you can see like that's their adult stages and basically if you do if you stick it onto a tree and then take it off then that'll kill a bunch of them so yeah and the final section that we want to talk about and the main feature of the app is the reporting a fly function. Now what this does is this takes you to Penn State's uh, web database where you can report the fly and it takes you through a process that shows you a bunch of images and it involves minimal work for the user. And this is one of the main goals of the project as a whole because not many people would use it if it was a long, tedious process and the idea was to expedite it as much as possible. So here you see all the ways that you can report it, different f uh, forms of the fly so it's easier to identify which one to report and you can return back to the main page to go whatever to whatever section. So uh, the name of the app was Lantern Spy. I came up with it, and uh, I think it was a pretty good uh, attempt at solving the lanternfly issue in providing a way for a lot of people to um, get involved and get educated on the topic. So this is Lantern Spy, uh, uh, <laughs> Lantern Spy and uh, this is our group. Thank you. What's interesting about the competition is that there are nine other schools at the IU and they arrived at nine o'clock and then by one o'clock they had to present. So they could do nothing before the competition. So everything you're seeing was put together over four hours. They worked through lunch and then they presented at one o'clock. So it was quite impressive. I think, I think this is a true testament to not only uh, having uh, two, uh, two teachers or two classrooms working together, but it's a true testament to the STEM activities that are, that are occurring here in the district. You know, obviously, in this short amount of time, you needed 
to focus on uh, you know collaboration and, and uh, communication in order to put this product together and, and try to solve real world problems. So uh, we appreciate the work that uh, Mr. Savis and uh, the rest of our, our teaching staff are doing and our students for volunteering and, and you know, taking the next step in, in this uh, tremendous journey that you have for a bright future ahead of you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate. If we can get a photo with you guys, yeah, if you don't mind. Thank you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Mr. Savitz, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's do it so we have the, the Routen Fry behind us. Definitely things high school students can do. I know Ms. Drummond had, had a question. We'll start with you. Is that fine? Yes. Uh, I just was wondering if when you submit the information, it looks like to the Penn State Cooperative Extension, what do you know what is done with the data? Or do they send people out or do they help eradicate the problem? Uh, well, the main goal that they have in the data collection is to map the migration patterns of the lanternfly because in order to take preventative measure to prevent their spread and their egg laying, they need to know where they're going. And so to do that, they wanted to get where people were seeing lanternflies in order to determine the most dense areas and where they might be migrating. So that data is plotted on a map and then the uh, Department of Agriculture takes steps accordingly depending on where it might be located. Other questions from members of the board? My only question was I got two of your names but I didn't get the other two people's names. I was just curious in case I see you in bright lights one day. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, um, I'm Stephen Brown. And I'm Joy Dubonsky. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Have a nice night. Uh, next on our agenda this evening, uh, we have uh, Ms. Gina Pardovich, uh, Director of uh, North Monco Technical Career Center. And she's here to, uh, she has about a 25 minute presentation, is that right? No, uh, we were talking about her, no. She really wants to introduce herself. She's, uh, our, new, our new director has done a tremendous job um, at uh, taking over the leadership role of, of, that, uh, of that facility, one that is, as you know, uh, you know, dear to all of our hearts and the fact that uh, you know, our value and, and the, uh, our strategic plan is aligned with trying to provide and, uh, career education opportunities for our students. And the North Monaco Technical Career Center does a, a tremendous job and is a, an integral part of that whole process. So, Ms. Pardovich? Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Good evening, everyone. Was my intention, if I was approved as a new director, to come out and visit all of the school boards because we don't always get to meet each other. And uh, in March, I was confirmed by the Joint Operating Committee of North Monaco Technical Career Center. And it's my pleasure to say I'm, I'm just about through my rounds through all five districts. I want to thank all of you for your support, for the students, for the school. It's a, we play an incredible role with uh, Pathways, with the Future Ready Index, more of which we'll be offering information and ways we're going to share that information for the North Monco students and help provide opportunities for the students at the districts too to meet those indicators. I just want to say thank you. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Sorry, it's not 25 minutes, more like 25 seconds. And to thank our joint operating committee members who are at all the meetings and we depend on greatly for our day-to-day -day business. Thank you all. It's a pleasure. 
And if I could ask our two uh, vocational uh, representatives and our board president to have a photo with some of them. Next on the agenda, we have uh, Ed Furman from uh, Mali, uh, who is our new auditors this year. And uh, Ed is going to present the 1718 audit presentation. Uh, Mr. Furman. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've completed the audit and we've issued the final financial statements. Uh, I put together an overall summary uh, that I'll walk you through instead of the 80-page the document. And I met with the Finance Committee a couple weeks ago, so unfortunately this will be a, a repeat for, for them. So again, this is the, uh, the small packet that says audit presentations. I'll walk you through that first. Uh, the first page is the agenda, the items I'm going to be walking you through on. The page after that is uh, entitled Required Communications. And w we issued an unmodified clean opinion on the uh, district financial statements. Uh, we also do what's called signal audit work, and that's the testing that's done on the federal programs. So based on the amount of federal money you get and the type of program, the federal government dictates what work we have to do with that. And we issued an unmodified clean opinion. We had no findings in our, our testing on the signal audit work. We also issued what's uh, called an SAS 114 report, and that's an audit committee letter. And whenever we issue an audit report, we're required to also issue this to the highest level of the audit client, which would be the school board. And we have to, have to identify if we had problems with the audit, uh, any issues, any material uh, adjustments, and that we had no, no problems with the audit there. The, the overall accounting records are in great shape. Um, so the 114 report, nothing in there. 115 report would be is if we determined that you had material weaknesses in your internal control system, we would issue a 115 report. And we had no, no findings with our testing there, so we will not issue uh, any 115 report. The page after that is uh, what I did is just try to summarize some of the audit work that we do. Uh, we download your entire general ledger, 100% uh, of the activity, into our audit software. Uh, then we run and do a data analytics test there. For expenses, we run pivot tables. Um, and again, for any uh, journal entries, we're looking for unusual entries, duplicate entries, um, material activity, and then based on that data analytic work, uh, that we make selections for the actual audit process. So again, the audit, from our perspective, uh, this was our initial year with the district, but it went very smooth. Uh, good controls, which we tested, and again, no findings to report. The uh, last page of the handout is just an overall financial summary. Uh, the main financial statement is only issues one year of data, so I gave you three years to look at some of the fluctuations. And the top section is called the government-wide financial statements, and that's a full accrual method of accounting where you capitalize your fixed assets, you record depreciation expense, uh, the bonds are recorded as liabilities, and you work your way down to net position or net equity of the school district. So the balance sheet there, uh, cash had a significant increase between 17 and 18. Uh, the capital assets actually went down a little bit. Again, you're rec recording depreciation expense on those assets. So you didn't really have any significant capital additions during the year, and the depreciation expense actually outran the additions. One thing you'll see in the detail financial statements is the age of the, the capital assets. In theory, we're depreciating those assets over their estimated useful life. And at the end of 18, you had about 60% of the life left on, on the capital assets of the district, which is a good percentage. Uh, the accounts payable went up slightly. The uh, bonds and notes payable was uh, virtually comparable, 
year to year. Compensated absences, that's accrued sit time and vacation time. Uh, that was up slightly. Um, there was a change in the accounting principles from the Government Accounting Standards Board this year uh, de dealing with the other post-employment benefits. And that's basically the medical coverage that you're providing to retirees. Uh, PEASERS also provides uh, a health uh, care benefit, uh, which was not recorded in the financials. And again, with the change of the accounting, the full unfunded liability for the OPEB has to be now put onto the balance sheet. So that's why you see you a significant jump from about five and a half million in 2017 up to over 24 million in 2018. Uh, one positive sign, not significant, but it was at least a decrease, is that the unfunded pension liability, which is through PEASERS, PEASERS uh, actuary actually does a calculation of this full liability and it allocates it to all the districts. Uh, so that's, the pension liability actually dropped about $4 million going into 2018. That still leaves you with a net position or, or a deficit of $121 million. And every school district in the state is the same way, mainly, again, because of that pension liability. Uh, the statement of activities is the revenue and expenses. Uh, the property tax increase went into effect in 2018. Uh, the other taxes and grants uh, were either comparable or down a little bit. Uh, the investment earnings, because of the increase in cash, and also now that the uh, interest rates are going up, you had a significant jump in the interest income for the year. Uh, some of the, the uh, expenses, the instruction and support services uh, actually dropped a little bit because of that, uh, that is including the benefit of the, the drop in the pension liability. Um, and the net change or net surplus for the year under the full accrual method was about $8 million. The uh, governmental funds, uh, you'll see in the financials, that's a separate set of funds. The general fund is how you do your budgeting, how you keep your books day to day. That's your main operating fund. And the general fund fund balance uh, actually went up because of the surplus of about two and a half million, went up to about 11 and a half million. And that's about 10% of your general fund revenues. And bond rating agencies usually do a safe harbor target of about eight to 12%. So you're, you're right in the middle of that safe harbor number. So you have a, a solid general fund fund balance at the end of 2018. Um, and the food service has had some small surpluses over the last three years. So again, as a quick run through of the 80-page the document, um, uh, some of the things that jump out again, the general fund fund balance is probably the, the key number where credit agencies are looking at that. And again, that's how you're keeping your books. And again, that's a solid uh, increase from 2018's activity. Thank you, Mr. Furman. Uh, at this time, are there any questions uh, for members of the board? From, from this side? Anyone from this side? Okay. Well, I, I know that uh, we, while we said this in our, I'm sorry. Sorry, it looks like Tim's Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I will say it'll be posted on the internet after today, after it's accepted by the board. Uh, I, I was going to say that uh, it's, it, it was said in the finance committee meeting that it's, it's been a pleasure working, you know, it's sometimes tough in a transition year, and, and maybe, Mr. Bricker, you could say this better, but uh, generally speaking, uh, we were pleased with the, the transition and, uh, and the work and the effort that uh, your team had put forward so, and, the, and the professionalism associated with all of this. So, so thank you, Mr. Furman, and you can send that message back to your team. I appreciate that. Yes, that, that's for the opportunity to service the district. Oh, thank you. Next on the agenda, I have a, I have a handout uh, at the table for members of the board. Um, this is the strategic plan update, and it's really just, it's, it's, a, it's out of sequence update. What I mean by that is generally every April, uh, we provide uh, an overview of where we are, what we've accomplished, uh, but this is, a, this presentation is really just a, a summary of uh, some previous review efforts that we, that we had. So uh, this will be posted uh, not only to uh, the strategic planning website, but also 
uh, the updated documents, and then most importantly, what you'll find at the end of this presentation is a new methodology for tracking our progress. And I want to share that with you because I think that was probably one of the hardest things uh, to, to really uh, uh, maneuver and, and, and to tell over the time. So I thank uh, Mr. Bricker for his uh, work with that and, and the rest of the administrative team. But taking you through this uh, just very summarily, uh, I want you to know that we held, we, tonight I'm just going to talk about the, the status, the, the purpose and the process of the review. I'm going to basically touch on the key areas that substantially are changing and how we are tracking the progress. So if you will, uh, in the presentation before you, just flip over. Um, we, we completed two years of the strategic plan and uh, we, we typically, as I said before, uh, provide a, a, an update, a comprehensive update every April. The purpose of, of doing a review process was to gather input from stakeholders. And we had about 50 plus stakeholders uh, involved from students to teachers to parents, uh, uh, leaders in our community as well as I think as several board members were also participated. So we appreciate that effort. Uh, we also then received a, a, you know, a, a couple dozen or so comments from the online process. And that put us all the way through from September 26th, where we had our first meeting of the whole, through some uh, uh, work in October, and then through this meeting here in November. And as you recall, the, we have five focus areas that deal with student growth and achievement, professional development, and, and uh, pupil services, as well as focus area two, communications and community relations, focus area three, safety, operational technology, facilities and infrastructure, focus area four, district operations, financial management, human resources, and area five, co-curricular, extracurricular activities and athletics. If you, if you flip over, summarily, what, what has substantially changed is there's some new uh, objectives with uh, uh, strategies listed for STEM. Uh, so we're pleased to get that feedback and, and add that. Uh, we have some new strategies for academic and extracurricular access. So I'll talk a little bit about that uh, this evening. Uh, communication strategies, uh, physical and programmatic safety measures, uh, some more uh, in inclusion uh, and input on the master plan process, uh, scheduling and hiring strategies. So if I, if I could just touch base with you, and all these things will be updated in, 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 a, in a comprehensive format on the uh, district website, uh, but under the strategic plan under area one, we had uh, the, we had a, the vision or the objective of uh, articulating the uh, district-wide uh, vision for STEM. And basically what, what, we've, what came out of this was uh, two important strategies, in addition, in addition to others, but two are the form of STEM strategic planning committee, inclusive of teachers, business, or administrators, business leader, leaders, higher education students, and Methacton Education Foundation and others to review the current practices, best practices, and to determine the opportunities and path forward for STEM in the Methacton School District. Uh, so we'll look, we, have a, we have a planning committee already in place in terms of uh, a, a small group to try to get this started uh, amongst the administrative team. Our, our goal is to branch out and, uh, and include, include more and, tr and meet that goal as it's uh, articulated. And then obviously develop and communicate the strategic plan of uh, STEM going forward. So those, those are some simple things. If we flip over to the next page, under, again, under focus area one, uh, strategic objective nine, to improve access to academic and extracurricular opportunities for all students. Now, I think this was, and, and Dr. Gatone, I know you led this process uh, for, in, this, in this area, um, but I think you know, this, this came out of uh, some of the uh, challenges that uh, uh, students had with trying to access courses uh, where um, there were weighted courses and not weighted courses and, and having more opportunities. Um, so so that, that was well articulated specifically by students. And we, th we thought it was uh, worthy of, of getting that on, on record and, and moving forward with a larger discussion to that whole uh, aspect. And they also talked about some of the other activities within the district like clubs, uh, sports, and getting access to a greater access and information so that they and their parents can help make better choices about the clubs and activities that, that students participate in. So we think that this is a great uh, objective uh, for an, an activity for us to, to work on and improve. 
Uh, area two, uh, which is communications, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion about consolidating the various types of communication platforms and tools that we use so that we get a, a more consistent uh, way of, of communicating uh, uh, from building to building and between the, the districts, uh, the district office and, and the building offices. So that generally sum, summarizes area two under strategic objective number four. If we flip over to area, over the next page, uh, which would be page five on your handout, uh, area two, strategic objective two, there was a lot of talk in this session uh, about positioning the Methacton School District as a school of choice. And uh, while we know what a great school district we have, we have great students, parents, uh, teachers, um, we have a great school board, we, we have a lot of great things going for us here. The challenge is, um, I don't think we toot our horn enough. And that was really the, the message that this committee had brought forward, and that's really what we need to do, and that's what this objective is all about. In area three, under safety, um, it's really about taking the safety audits that were formerly on our strategic plan and making sure that, that we uh, integrate them into all the work that we do. So from integrating them into the master planning process and making sure that they're tracked and documented uh, so that we uh, you know, get those, those uh, physical safety uh, suggestions in place as soon as possible. And next, if we flip over to, this, to page six, area three, uh, there's, a re there's also a recommendation that, um, that our professional development needs to, regarding safety, needs to kind of broaden itself in terms of not only what we do for our employees in Methaxon, but we have quite a number of third-party vendors that, that play a huge role in keeping our students safe. So from uh, our, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our, our vendor as first student, we're providing busing transportation to our uh, Aramark uh, vendor to other vendors that, that uh, participate with us on a regular basis. We need to expand and make sure that everything is under um, one umbrella and everybody is being consistently informed and trained related to uh, all the proper uh, uh, safety practices. Next on this slide, under safety under strategic objective three, to perform traffic studies on the high school and our COLA campuses uh, to reduce congestion and increase safety on the, on the two campuses. And basically, this goes back to uh, some discussion about you know, how do we you know, c you know, deal with traffic flow and, and how can we make it safer for students to walk to school. And um, it's a conversation that I think we as a board have, has had at one time or another as well. So that, that came up in conversation and was added. Uh, next, if we flip over to page seven, uh, page seven talks about area three uh, safety again under strategic objective four to, to review the existing bullying and cyberbullying programs and activities within the district uh, and to assess the proper developmental appropriateness, frequency of, of program and activity use and challenges, gaps, overlaps uh, in the program and implementation at, at the different levels and recommend uh, any, any appropriate changes. So this is a, a, a comprehensive review from K through 12 of all of our uh, uh, bullying and cyber bullying uh, programs. And we're gonna, it suggests that we use, uh, we leverage you know, input from parents, we input from the PAYS survey, and which is, which is student uh, data, uh, and, a, and a number of other uh, uh, strategic uh, research opportunities for us to leverage a, a program that would be improved here. Uh, next, on the same page, we have operational technology and a strategic objective three. Uh, again, area three to evaluate research and recommend and replace current district-wide telephone system. So I think that's one that uh, Dr. Sosnovic is, uh, is involved with even at this moment. Uh, but it's important, it's been overdue for a number of years and, and he's taking the leadership on that role. If we go over to number eight, page eight, under area three, we have the facilities and infrastructure under strategic objective one uh, to leverage the master plan. But I think one of the things that is, is important here while that's been in the strategic plan, we want to integrate the recommendations uh, of transportation services. We want to integrate uh, input from students and staff. Uh, those are things that we haven't gotten uh, into the master planning process. Um, so those are some of the recommendations as, a, as they're listed here in front of you. Um, again, on page eight, area four, we look at leveraging scheduling as an ongoing strategic activity to strengthen and supplement 
uh, st strengthen the core and supplemental instructional programming and to provide more and efficient uh, program and services while creating flexibility to meet the needs of our students. So we think that uh, while there's work going on uh, at Arcola in terms of the, the uh, professional staff working with uh, Dr. Mangano and the, and the team there to look at scheduling and opportunities, uh, we think that you know, a, a constant review of scheduling at all levels uh, would be appropriate. Uh, if we go to then to page number nine, uh, under human resources, we know that uh, under strategic objective two, that uh, while we want to improve the effectiveness and consistency in the hiring practices to align them with laws, policies, and procedures, I think a lot of this uh, grew out of uh, you know a new way to approach accessing that talent pool. And what I think, uh, Mr. Regina found, as well as the rest of the committee, that it's, it's quite likely that, you know, old ways of trying to attract certain uh, professionals um, uh, may not necessarily be the, the right way to do it these days, uh, in, special, in, in light of all the, the access to things in social media. So um, I think the committee had suggested that there's got to be a new way to reach the, the talent pool, and this is what this objective is designed to do. Under area five, uh, which is, uh, bless you, under area five, which is uh, related to athletics and activities, uh, both objective one and two really uh, look at increasing participation rates and availability of opportunities. And, and actually, one of the main things that came out of that was to really look at uh, the um, activity runs for both athletics and activities. So a number of years ago, many of you may not remember this, but there used to be act activity of bus runs uh, at certain buildings after on certain days for students to get home. And one of the, the, the concerns that we heard from, from this committee was that you know, that would be an excellent opportunity to provide access to not only the activities in, in the clubs, uh, but also to athletics. So that's, that really summarizes, oh, we have one more on, on the back page here, I'm sorry. Um, and then on this last strategic objective under uh, athletics and activities is to really look at uh, the recurring process for gathering feedback on activity offerings throughout the district. So that includes your clubs. So as a result of us putting together the activities handbook, uh, distributing that, uh, working with the association on, on fine tuning some of that uh, language, uh, we think that we have uh, a manual that provides the guidance for us to, on an annual basis, allow the principals and the staff at the local buildings to help uh, make some of the, those decisions about what the, the proper use of, of uh, the, the, the resources that we have in order to offer the clubs that are necessary for the student growth and, and uh, enrichment. So on the last page, uh, which is a full page, you know, I, I think it's important for the, the board to understand how we are going to move forward with tracking the progress. And uh, Mr. Bricker was very helpful in, in putting this together, but we're going to use this, so we're going to update it regularly, and it'll be on the website. Um, but what it does is it allows us to not only uh, measure where we are in terms of the objective under each uh, focus area, but the, un under each task what we've been able to complete. So we're going to be able to show percentages associated with the task and percentages associated with the objectives. So that uh, probably by the end of the, probably by the end of next week, um, we'll have uh, not only the documents, but these uh, uh, tracking uh, uh, charts online for uh, you know, the, the, the staff and the public to, to help us uh, through that. So I know this is quite a lot of information. Um, I probably spent another you know, half hour to an hour on this, but I think it's important that uh, many of you who were in attendance and, and, and the people that have participated know that um, you know, th there's a lot of good additions to uh, the strategic plan. Um, and I think that doing a regular check like this um, is important for us to just make sure that, hey, are, are we still on the right, are we still targeting the right things? Are we still putting the right, uh, putting our energy to the right priorities? And I think that's what this really, this document uh, really does. So questions from, the, from members of the board. Thanks for putting this uh, together. I know that sitting through the safety that there was a lot of good input from family, from students and from parents, uh, teachers also uh, along the way, especially on such an important idea. So I like seeing those. The only thing I would add sort of, uh, on these, there's a sort of inconsistency in timing. 
from a smart goal perspective. Sometimes it says third quarter 2019. Sometimes it says nothing. We need these uh, the measurement tool that you showed on the last page to be objective uh, consistently across the board. So yeah. I would like to see uh, specific dates on the actions. Yeah, we 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 do that for this is a this is a an abbreviated summary. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes, Mrs. Hall. Uh, I just want to say I, I was involved with area two, the communications. And uh, one of the topics we did discuss was how do we improve communication with residents that do not have children in the schools? We have a very large population without um, children in the schools and how are we getting information out to them? So with um, hiring of a new communications director, I think it would be a, a good time to have that ask. Good point. Uh, other questions, other comments? I, I just had the question of, um, so then this information is going to be integrated with the current strategic plan and then shared with, like on the website, I guess? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I believe that ends the uh, presentations for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Moving on to reports, we'll start with the Finance Committee and Mr. Earnshaw. Thank you. Uh, the Finance Committee met on November 14th. The meeting was called to order at 6.33 p.m. Um, all committee members were in attendance along with Mr. Furman from Mali LLP, the district's audit firm. Uh, the meeting began with the monthly financial reports as we normally do. Mr. Bricker presented a list of bills, treasurer's report, budgetary transfers, and the expenditure and revenue reports. I responded to questions from the committee that he received via email and at the meeting. Uh, he also provided commentary on October's year-to-date revenues and expenditures in comparison to budget. Uh, the list of bills, treasury report, and budgetary transfers are on the agenda for tonight for approval. Uh, he also provided, uh, Mr. Brecker that is, provided an update on the discussion with the MEA regarding the salary schedule, and he reviewed the master plan fund tracking report and responded to questions. Uh, he also reviewed the healthcare consortium report for the prior year and the current fiscal year, uh, responded to questions on that, and gave us an update on where uh, the evaluation of alternatives to the district's consortium stands. And we're expecting to get a recommendation on the future participation in the consortium in early 2019. Uh, regarding discussion topics, uh, Mr. Furman presented the district's audit report, um, basically the same presentation he gave to us here tonight. Um, in addition to that, he went through the 80-page audit report that he referred to and highlighted key aspects of that report. Uh, prior to Mr. Furman leaving the meeting, uh, we gave the public an opportunity to ask comments regarding the 2017-18 audit, and Joe Bickelman from Lower Providence asked about the presentation of the healthcare consortium in the financials, and Mr. Furman responded to that question. Uh, we then talked about the surplus from 2017-18, which is approximate, was approximately $2.6 million. Uh, Mr. Bricker provided an analysis of what led to that surplus, uh, and we talked about that at the work session last week, and I believe it's also on the agenda for tonight at, for discussion. Um, a couple other matters discussed were two job descriptions that are, that are on the agenda for tonight, uh, the establishment of Assistant Director of Business Services and an Accounting Specialist. Um, Dr. Zerby also discussed the elimination of two positions that are currently vacant and are not in the budget for the current year, those being the secretary to the director of business services and the secretary to the supervisor of transportation, um, and the elimination of those is also on the agenda tonight. Uh, for courtesy of the floor, Joe Bickelman from Lower Providence commented on or asked questions regarding the 2017-18 budget surplus analysis and related analytics, use of the 2017-18 budget surplus, uh, the tax assessment relating to a commercial property in Lower Providence and IU transportation costs. Uh, John Andrews from Lower Providence commented on or asked questions regarding the 2017-18 budget surplus analysis, delinquent taxes, use of the budget surplus, the list of bills, uh, certain slides and information presented at the November 8th special meeting of the board, and enrollment projections and related birth data. Uh, and finally, our meeting adjourned at 8.59 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Earnshaw. Uh, for Property and Transportation Committee, Mr. Navarrete. Now, the Property Committee met on uh, November the 12th. 
Uh, the meeting was called to order at 6.31 p.m. In attendance were all committee members, Dr. Zerbe, Mr. Bricker, and Mr. Fretz. From Fidavia, we had Mr. Sikala, Bob Nowitzki, our new project lead, and Mr. Don Kozer. Uh, under the master plan, uh, the committee reviewed the 2018 capital projects financial summary and the updated master plan workbook. Uh, the committee requested electronic copies of both documents. Mr. Bricker stated that he would present the bond fund tracking spreadsheet at the finance committee meeting and then email to all property committee members. Uh, under our COLA, Mr. Sakal updated us last week's work session um, at the committee meeting. Mr. Nowitzki did the update, um, also said we, were, we would be substantially complete by November 30th. Uh, it was noted by Dr. Zerby that the first event in the new auditorium will be the Arcola Winter Concert on December 11th. So I hope to see everybody there. Um, Mr. Earnshaw asked about the retainage amounts on the projects and the final cost of the auditorium project. Mr. Sakala replied that the project will likely end up under budget. Uh, the retainage amounts and time will be as permitted by law. He noted that it will take several months before the projects can be financially closed out. Uh, Mrs. Reese also questioned whether there were any water leaks in the new roof. Mr. Kozer replied that during construction there had been a minor leak, but it was associated with an existing exhaust fan cover that had been installed incorrectly. Uh, at the high school, uh, the MEP project um, uh, is underway. Excuse me, the, the final commissioning for the MEP project was underway and is now in the closeout phase. Um, as Dan noted last week, the uh, emergency work change order that we had approved um, had come in at $58,800, well below the initial low end estimate of $85,000 and the maximum authorization of $200,000. Um, Mr. Scott also informed the committee that investigative work on the masonry project that's needed to create the bidding drawings and specifications for 2019 work was nearly completed and would be updated to the committee next month. Um, the consultant contract status, which Dan reviewed with us last week, um, we discussed that. I don't, I don't worry with details, uh, except I'll note uh, two specific topics. Um, on number 21C for the high school, um, Dr. Zerby noted that there are continuing discussions happening with the post prom committee leadership regarding storage and materials, and the administration is reviewing project alternatives. Um, also, regarding the uh, drainage issues at Woodland, Mr. Fretz spoke to the need to address the water shedding in front of Woodland. Um, uh, the committee asked that it be numbered as a new project. Uh, we can discuss that, I guess, later tonight when that comes up in the agenda. Um, under stormwater project, Mr. Sakala informed the committee that this project has now finally been closed out uh, and the project cost was less than previously reported. Um, he would have that information to us shortly. Uh, under transportation, Mr. Bricker informed the committee that several potential changes are going to be reviewed and proposed for the 2019 school year. Um, one of those will not be a change in the uh, routing software. Um, Mr. Earnshaw asked about the coordinator position that has yet to be filled. I believe that was discussed last week. Uh, during the work session. We won't go through that. Under courtesy of the floor, uh, John Andrews of Lower Providence asked multiple questions about the presentation made at the special meeting of the board on November 8th, asked if the public feedback will be posted on the website. Dr. Zerby stated that it would be sent to the board and not posted publicly. Uh, he requested more consideration for a K-5 to elementary school arrangement, stated that he does not believe that we can afford full day kindergarten, requested public committees on any school consolidation effort and commented on the Malone and McBroom updated enrollment projections. Uh, Jim Mollick of Worcester commented on the decision-making process for Arrowhead, commented on potential conflicts of interest from a previous superintendent, quoted the property taxes paid by Mr. Navarrete, commented on Mr. Navarrete's voting record, questioned whether it was true that no renovations have been made to Arrowhead in 41 years, and stated that he was taking the matter to an outside agency. Joe Bickelman of Audubon raised a concern about bus roster availability to drivers, commented on the presentation made at the November 8th special meeting, questioned the capacity of Arcola, and requested hard copy flyers about the Arrowhead discussion be delivered to every home in the district. The meeting was adjourned at 7.56. Thank you, Mr. Navarrete. Moving on to Education Committee and Ms. Reese. Um, we met on uh, November 5th. We were called to order at 6.30. We started by reading the same executive session announcement that uh, Ms. Larsonese read this evening. In attendance was everyone in the committee other than Dr. Zerby who was participating in the um, Minithon fundraiser. So thank you for doing that. 
First up was AP, SAT, and ACT results. Um, some of the highlights were 780 total AP exams were taken. Um, almost 96% scored three or above, with 70% with of that earning a score of four, or f four and five. And then we have 27 national AP scholars. Next, Dr. Sosnovic um, went over, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, my minutes are a little, Social Sentinel, um, which is MCIU is offering consortium pricing. Ten Montgomery County districts have purchased it. Methacton is not purchasing right now, but will monitor and revisit in the future. Dr. Engstead also gave a gifted update. We are currently in the third year of conducting universal screening. 331 second graders screened this school year and results were back in, in November. The first group that uh, participated in the universal screening will be at Skyview next year and that is it, when it'll be a good time to reflect on the data and decide if additional screening should be provided. Um, Dr. Engstead also gave us a REACH update. Um, REACH is fully staffed with two clinical psychologists. It officially started on November 5th. The district is utilizing two rooms, one full size and one small group. They have scheduled two groups, one in seventh, one in eighth, both with an AM and a PM. Intake meetings occurred uh, with parents and they went very well. There's 16, possibly 17 students participating as of now. Um, Mrs. Rickey went over professional development and reviewed the two in-service opportunities. First up was October 12th. There were 49 different events offered. 23 of those sessions were facilitated by staff. There was an all-staff meeting in the middle of the day, which encompasses about 630 staff members, so um, not always easy to coordinate. Um, there was mention that 106 staff members were absent. On November 6th, all elementary staff met at Worcester, several training sessions on new offerings, and many staff members participated in outside district sessions at different IUs and districts across the area. Um, there was also a Wilk STEM update. If you remember from the previous meeting, we have a wonderful opportunity for some STEM professional development for our staff. 13 staff members at that time, at the beginning of the month, were signed up with 10 still deciding. Um, but it, the program will be capped at 20. As uh, every month, we uh, reviewed the enrollment report and had courtesy of the floor. Joe Bickelman from Audubon requested Methacton does not build Arrowhead. He suggests district reconfigure grades K to 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12, and adds that Colonial uses this configuration for the last 30 years. He's unhappy that we paid Malone and McBroom. John Andrews from Lower Providence informed us that he put in a right to know request regarding communication with m and Once correction to study made for the 11-8 meeting, he suggests a configuration of K to five at four schools. Jim Mullick at Worcester reiterated Mr. Bickelman's comments, questioned our motivation, and believes it is political. He does not like that many board members have students in the district. He mentioned how, ma how many, some, how much uh, some board members pay in taxes. Um, we adjourned at 7.50. Thank you, Ms. Rees. Policy Committee, Ms. Hall. The Policy Committee met on November 7th. Uh, the meeting was called to order at 6.31 p.m. In attendance, Ms. Larceny, myself, Mr. Ryan, Dr. Zerby, and Mr. Summers. Um, Mr. Earnshaw was not in attendance. Uh, for policies previously discussed, policy 349, uh, bullying and cyberbullying, which is an employee-related policy, was recommended for first reading with modifications. For policies recommended for first discussion, policy 105 curriculum, 108 adoption of textbooks, 704 maintenance, policy 806 child abuse are recommended for first reading. And please note the PSBA version is the one recommended for first reading on the 806 child abuse due to updates in legislation and additional legal citations needed. There are no policies under five-year review that were discussed. There was no old or new business. And during courtesy of the floor, Dr. Malik inquired about policy 903 and the use of electronic recording devices. Dr. Malik recommended that the committee make certain that any modifications to policy 006 meetings include current working, excuse me, current wording on executive session statements. He also asked questions regarding courtesy of the floor during special meetings. Um, and the meeting adjourned at 8.11 p.m.
Thank you, Ms. Hull. Uh, the intermediate unit, Mr. Ryan. Thank you. The Montgomery County Intermediate Unit met on November 14, 2018. Uh, the meeting started with the appointment of a new MCIU board uh, member from Pottstown, replacing uh, Emmanuel Wilkerson, who resigned. Uh, we went through our normal financial reports and list of bills. We also approved three initial budgets. Um, there was over seven pages of personnel matters. Um, that is typically um, what happens in the IU in the beginning of the year. Um, in terms of other financial matters, we did uh, discuss and approve the refinancing of one of their loans for the Anderson School. Uh, it was a variable rate that was moved to a fixed rate. Um, they did discuss um, more social sentinel software and seven new districts signed on. Uh, there was also discussion of um, the non-public schools within these districts for um, Part A Title II grants. There was some discussion on the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit and the Methacton School District's uh, professional development, uh, building fidelity with secondary writing. And let's see what the other ones was on the last page here. Um, it was the uh, administration recommends the appointment of the following individuals to the Student Wellness Committee. Um, and, they, and they stressed that the, um, each district kind of go through and, and do the same thing as well. Um, in terms of the general um, legislative update that was given, uh, because of the timing of this, there wasn't much of an update um, from, the, from the last time. Um, it was made mention that many of the uh, Senate bills um, and House bills now have official act uh, numbers associated with them. Um, and then they did also um, urge the uh, Montgomery County School Districts in the Safe to Say program and the need to appoint a three to five member team, which will need to be established to be points of contact to receive and act, um, to receive and act upon tips. Uh, this is regard to the um, Sandy Hook promise. So I did want to make sure that I touched base with Dr. Zerby and the Education Committee to make sure that we're on board there. Um, and that is all we had. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Uh, the North Monco Technical Career Center, Ms. Drummond and Ms. Reese. Yes. Um, the Joint Operating Committee of the North Monco Technical Career Center met on November 19th. Um, we discussed the um, culinary instructor, Jane Mitchell, who is the recipient of the 2018 Carl Schaefer Memorial Award and will be traveling to Texas to receive that award. Um, there is one recipient in the whole nation and, and our, um, our instructor won that award. Uh, in addition, there is a breakfast being hosted um, in the restaurant on Thursday, December 13th, where Fox 29 um, Bob Kelly will be broadcasting live from 9 to 10 a.m. And also on December 8th, there is a Breakfast with Santa event from 9 to 11 a.m., which is open to the public. Um, and that was pretty much what we covered. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. And now our student board representatives, Caleb and Saket. With Acton will host the annual winter concert on December 19th at 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium. The concert will feature performances from the band and string orchestra. Also, on December 4th, new members will be inducted into the Tri-M Music Honor Society. Tri-M focuses on preparing for performances along with helping out throughout the Methacton music community. Additionally, several Methacton clubs and sports have partnered with We Can, an organization that helps with uh, students with cerebral palsy. And these clubs are sponsoring a child during the holiday season hoping to make a difference one child at a time. The winter sports season has started at Methacton. Winter sports include basketball, cheerleading, indoor track, swimming, and wrestling. A notable event coming up is the Methacton Boys Basketball Home Opener on December 8th. The boys will face Box Hill Senior Secondary College, which is a school located in Melbourne, Australia. Next, Methacton's Multicultural Club will be selling homemade candles during lunches and in the counseling offices on Tuesdays and Thursdays through December 21st for $5 or $10. The candles are four ounces or eight ounces and are made of all natural soy wax and a wide variety of fragrance oils. 
All proceeds will be donated to Cecil and Grace Bean Soup Kitchen and to Acclimo Family Center in Norristown to benefit low-income families. Thank you. Uh, the Methacton Education Foundation, I believe we have Ms. Kralovich. Um, tonight, I have a short report for you. First of all, thanks for letting us do the check presentation this evening. Uh, we're really excited to be able to support the <coughs> memberships for the Montgomery County Science Teacher Association as well as um, help fund the marching band's trip to the Liberty Bowl this year. In the last month, we have wrapped up our EITC uh, appeal for um, individuals. We also just started the parent appeal where we are asking parents to donate a dollar for every day that their kids are in school. We're rounding that up to 180. Um, we don't want to count snow days and stuff. <laughs> Um, we will be running the parent campaign into the new year as uh, we learn the giving habits of the Methacton community. Today is also Giving Tuesday. Uh, we had an online campaign today and um, encouraged people to donate to the foundation as well as the other many causes that they support. Um, and we are recruiting grandparents for our grandparent campaign to start in the new year. So if you know of any grandparents that want to get involved, let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Krelovich. The superintendent's report, Dr. Zerby. I have no report for this evening, I, but I do hope that uh, all of our members of the board and our community had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. At this time, I'll take public comment on any board action items for this evening. Mr. Andrews? John Andrews, Law of Providence, uh, good evening. Uh, <clears throat> you have uh, on the fiscal items on the, this evening's agenda, you have uh, D, budgetary surplus discussion, and E, the, the audit report. Uh, it seems to me those, those uh, discussions ought to be reversed uh, because we, we waited on the audit to find out what, uh, what surplus we had. But regarding the surplus, which uh, came in uh, surprisingly high, uh, and uh, we there's an eight percent limit on the surplus in the general fund, so we can't uh, park it there. So my recommendation is that there be a 50-50 split of that surplus between the renovations account and tax relief and, and uh, funds be dispersed to those two accounts equally over two years. Uh, that's simple and, and, uh, and I think it's fair. So I offer that for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Public comment from anyone else this evening? Mr. Bickelman. Uh, <clears throat> Joe Bickelman from Audubon. Uh, this has to do with the audit report, I guess. It has to do with the surplus. Uh, it was reported that uh, we were $211,000 under the budgeted amount for unemployment compensation, uh, which contributed to the surplus, I believe. Um, I just want the board to be aware that in 1415, uh, when the uh, bus drivers were outsourced, there was a $450,000 expenditure that was going to have to be budgeted for. And uh, I just want to make sure that you make sure that that was removed and uh, that $211,000 isn't part of that large uh, budget amount of $450,000 of unemployment compensation associated with outsourcing of the bus drivers. Uh, make sure that didn't remain in there. And uh, just want you to check that out. Uh, on the uh, the minutes of the uh, special meeting on November 8th, uh, my last uh, name is spelled wrong. It's L-E instead of E-L. Uh, I would like that corrected before you uh, uh, bind the minutes. And I just want to uh, commend Andrea Reese for her uh, 
minutes on the education committee that was well done, uh, you can actually tell uh, the speakers uh, how they feel about the issues. It isn't just a statement that someone spoke of the enrollment or spoke of this or spoke of that. You can actually get the slant on that individual's feeling and uh, you know how they express themselves either positively or negatively on the issues. So don't let anybody cha change your mind on how you present those minutes in the future. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beckman. Dr. Malik. Jim Malik, Worcester. Um, if you're going to um, run for office and be a board member, have the courtesy to be here. You know. Dr. Malik, this is the time for public comment on board uh, action and, uh, items. And the reason, yeah, I'm making a comment. On a board action item. For the right, season. I'm making a comment on D, because if you remember the last meeting, all you guys were make, waiting for your comment based on Mr. Navarrete's input. Remember that? That's what I'm commenting about. You were all waiting for his input. He wasn't here last meeting, remember? You were waiting for his comment. He wasn't here last meeting, and you couldn't comment, because you were waiting for his comment. Not here again. There, there he is over there again, not here. So have the courtesy to be here, because the way you have things structured, I won't get to hear his comment before I make my comment again. So I got to guess what his comment's going to be to make my comment. So what we have regarding D, budgetary surplus, is competing philosophies between Mr. Navarrete and Mr. Earnshaw. Mr. Earnshaw realizes that we're talking about our money. Whereas Mr. Navarrete thinks it's his money. Now, Mr. Navarrete seems to ignore the hardworking taxpayer, the senior citizens who can't afford their prescription drugs and mortgage payments. Where Mr. Navarrete isn't thinking about those families who have two or three kids in college at forty to fifty thousand dollars a piece, who could use that money back, our money back. He wants to take what he thinks is his money and put it into the capital reserves. And that's why I talk about the competing philosophy theory. Now, why does he do that? Well, he, the way I calculate it, he's being subsidized by the taxpayer to the tune of 35000 bucks. That's the way I calculate the figures. Now, I also ask myself, why is he fixated on putting that money into the capital reserves to offset the debt? So I did some research, and I found the Act 1 referendum, referendum exemption worksheet and noted the calculations are based upon current and next year's total principal and interest payments. Did you guys know about that? You aware of that? You aware about that, Dr. Zarmi? The Act One referendum exemption worksheet for building projects. Continue on, Dr. Are you aware about that, Madam Chairman? Because that would explain the fixation on lowering your debt. Because otherwise, your projects are going to go to referendum. You aware about that? You aware of that? You won't be able to build your $25 million school without going to a referendum unless you reduce your debt to a certain point. That's why you want to throw the money in, right? Is that the reason, Ralph? Dr. Malik, <laughs> I your think comments that, are supposed to be I think that's here. the reason. Now, my other question comes to the audit. Did the audit pick up the uh, $2.6 million surplus in 2017-18? Can anybody answer that question? Dr. 
Dr. Malik, your time is up. Can you answer that? We can bring it up during our, our vote later on this evening if the board so chooses. But at this point, you've hit the four minute mark. I'm going to ask you can, to wrap up. Can you just answer it? Did it, did it I'm address ask you it? To wrap up now. I know. Did the audit address it? Dr. Malik, I'm asking you again. Just you give me a yes or no. Limit, please, just give me a yes up. or no. Just a yes or no. Simple. I'm not answering your question, Dr. Malik. Anyone else for public comment on board action items? So may I have a motion to approve the board meeting minutes attached for the October 16th, 2018 work session, the October 23rd, 2018 regular board meeting, and the special meeting on November 8th, 2018 is attached. Ms. Reese, is there a second? Ms. Cancrow, any comments from the board? I would imagine Mr. Bickelman's comment is recorded and will be noted. About change wanted. If the um, the individual who made the motion and, and who made the second are willing to uh, stipulate that uh, the motion is to approve the minutes with the name correction, is that fair? I made the original motion, and that's probably why I did make the original motion. So if, if it could be, if Mr. Bickelman's name could be um, corrected that and the motions. And the individual who seconded that is in agreement? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Are there any other comments from the board? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote and we'll start down here with Ms. Reese. Yes. 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 The motion carries 9-0. Moving on to fiscal items, Mr. Bricker. Tonight for your approval, we have the list of bills, the treasurer's report, budgetary transfers, uh, budgetary surplus discussion recommended by the Finance Committee, the 2017-2018 audit to accept the June 30, 2018 financial statements and single audit report as presented by Mally, which will be posted upon approval by the board, and five items under the master plan. May I have a motion to approve the list of bills, treasurer's report, and budgetary transfers as presented? Mr. Winters, is there a second? Mr. Earnshaw, any comments from the board? Um, I had a couple of questions on the list of bills, if you don't mind, Mr. Bricker. Um, on page three, there is um, a bill from Dishel Bartle and Dooley for $1,020. And in the comments, uh, the memo, it says for right to know for September. Is that correct? I'm opening them up now. Okay. Uh, the reason that I ask is I know that our average over the last four years for right to know legal fees was about a little over $5,000 per year. So I'm just curious as to why we're spending $1,000 for one month. Where, where is that on this? It's on page three in the list of bills. I'll have to look into that one to see what it's for. Okay. And if it covers just one month or more. Okay, that, that would be good to know. And then on page 10, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Zerby, there's a, an item in there for mileage for you. And the only reason I'm questioning it is that it was a large sum, so I'm assuming that this was accrued mileage. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that that was not one really long road trip. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. And thank you, Mr. Bricker. Are there any other comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, um, we'll take a vote. We'll start down here with Mrs. Reese again. Yes. 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 Okay. The motion carries 9-0. Okay. So here we have um, not a motion. 
this is um, recommended by the Finance Committee to discuss and review the surplus resolution that was approved in fiscal year 2017-2018, whereby any surplus from the 2017-2018 budget where the uncommitted fund balance would exceed 7% of the budget was to be committed to the master plan projects. So we started this conversation last week. Um, Mr. Earnshaw presented one side and, and a rationale, um, and it sounded like the board members had some questions, and um, it, based on my understanding of what transpired at the um, Finance Committee, uh, Mr. Neverett had a, a, a different um, viewpoint on the matter, and I know uh, Ralph, you weren't able to attend last week. Um, I'm hoping you could maybe, uh, I guess, shed some light on, on your perspective. Yeah, I don't think, I'll try not to if, if I go on too long I'm here, sorry. but hey, thanks Ralph, for- uh, Ralph, can I just interrupt for one second? Um, Dr. Zerby provided a handout. I wonder if you could review that first. I assume that Ralph, Mr. Neverett has a copy of that as well. Yeah, you should have that in an email. Yeah, I do. I have it. Okay. okay. But Mr. Nabra, is it okay if we Dr. Zerby review, reviews that first? Yeah, kind absolutely. of level set, make sure everyone's on the same page here. So, so in front of you is a uh, is is a basically a summary to help us guide us through this conversation today uh, or this evening. So, what the what this is 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 the capital related funds. It was not actually the capital fund budget, but the capital related fund balances summary. So. What I wanted to make sure on left-hand column is, is that we said the unassigned fund balance uh, was to equal 7% of the 17-18 ending budget. So the $2.7 million that w in general that we're speaking of that was in surplus would then be allocated to the unassigned fund balance, making the unassigned fund balance 7% of the 17-18 ending budget, which gives us a total of 765 uh, $7 million. In the next line, we talk about the 2016-17 committed fund balance of $374,000, and then the, uh, which would then for 17-18 committed fund balance uh, of $2,014,000. Uh, uh, and these, these two numbers represent uh, the determinations, uh, or two resolutions, for 16, 17, and 17, 18 to have any remaining surplus put into the uh, uh, master plan uh, project fund, okay? And so the total of that would then be, uh, uh, if we stay on, on target and on path with what we've, we said we were going to do, you would have $2.38 million in the master plan uh, fund. Then on the next uh, line, we have a capital reserve account. And that currently, as of uh, October uh, 31st, has $481,000 in it. And the capital campaign account has $48,000 in it. And both of these accounts, you should know, you know change on a regular basis. So we, we are still receiving uh, funds in from uh, donors for the capital campaign account. And we're also expending some money in the capital uh, reserve account. And then the next item is the estimated un unused master plan 2018 bond proceeds of 466,000. So that's a, again, it's an estimate that uh, Mr. Berger had put together that will likely result uh, from the borrowing and the projects uh, if they complete on budget. So then what we do is we add those up. We add the total of the committed uh, funds with the capital reserve, the capital campaign, and the unused master plan of uh, 2018 bond proceeds for a total of $3,384,000. And if you subtract out those items that, that can only be used for capital projects, so there's certain funds like the capital uh, reserve account that can only be used uh, for, for capital projects and the uh, master plan bond uh, m money can only be used for, for capital projects. You are then left with $2.437 million that could, could theoretically be made available or reallocated if a need is determined. So while we have committed money to the master plan in, in, in based on our last resolution and the surplus that we received, uh, we would have $2.38 million. Um, that money, along with some of the other funds that are listed in this uh, sheet, would, would allow us to, to, if we so choose to, 
uh, find a different need and could allocate it differently if we wanted to. So that's what I wanted you to understand with those numbers. Are there any questions so far on that? Is everybody, is everybody good with that? So that means basically you have $2.4 million that you can do something with if you want to do something different than what you've already determined. So then what I wanted to do is, and these may not be inclusive of every potential option, but I wanted to at least lay out some options that the board could consider for the use of that $2.4 million. So the first one would be to remain on the current path with the resolution to allocate the surplus exceeding 7% of the final 1718 budget to the master plan projects. Uh, this is the one that the administration and myself recommend uh, we do. And within that, uh, you could borrow less for the targeted 2019 summer project. So let's say, for example, we have right now estimated that we might spend $6 million on uh, the, the, two th the summer 2019 project. You could technically uh, borrow somewhere in the neighborhood of $2.4 million less and, um, and still get those projects done. You could otherwise decide to take on more projects for the uh, summer of 2019. Now, we know that somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to $100 million of projects are, are still kind of out there over a 10-year period. Uh, you, why we might have allocated $6 million and maybe want to borrow $6 million to do what's currently on the, on the, on the targeted list, uh, we might want to do $8 million, so, or $8.5 million. So that's the, the, the idea there. And the last one, under 1C, would be to reserve the, the amount of money that you have to offset future borrowing. So you may not want to deal with anything this summer um, in terms of uh, doing more projects this summer or uh, reducing the borrowing. You might just want to hold on to that money for future uh, borrowing that may happen you know, a year from now or two years from now, whatever you decide you want to do. So then the next you know, general option is to allocate some portion or all of the available funds to other one-time expenses. Um, so I think that may be similar to what uh, Mr. Earnshaw may have been suggesting at, at our last meeting. Uh, another option would be to pay down any existing debt. The next option could be uh, provide tax reduction or rebate back to taxpayers. Another option could be to allocate a portion or all, of, all to offset expenditures in next year's budget. And the last one, uh, pay off some of this year's one-time unexpected expenditures. So like for example, we didn't expect to have uh, the work that we need to do to the modulars at Arrowhead. Um, so you know, that's like a hundred some thousand dollars. You know, it's not gonna obviously eat into a large chunk of the 2.4 million, but it was, it was some of the unexpected, unexpected expenditures. So I think that might summarize up what some of the options are. There might be others. You might have some other uh, ideas your own, of your own, but I wanted to allow you to at least understand that this is probably all the, uh, most many of the things that you could, you could do. But also knowing that uh, we, we, we believe that our, your, the best option for the district is knowing of all the projects that are ahead of us um, to uh, leverage in one way or another, A, B, or C, or some other combination of that, um, to make sure we stay on the path to get these projects done. So uh, that, that summarizes that sheet. Do any, does anybody have any questions on the sheet before we allow uh, members of the board to talk on what their recommendation options are be? No? Okay. Well, I think you're up, man. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, no, no, that's okay. Um, I just, I don't want to pit this as a... Um, uh, a discussion of B versus Brian, because I think ultimately we're really very close to on the same page here. Right? This is a, this is a positive discussion about tax relief in one form or another, whether it's now or whether it's later. Uh, it's just a matter of how we get there. Um, I think if our district was in better financial shape, uh, we'd be contributing funds annually to our capital reserve account. And we'd only be borrowing to fund the largest projects, whether they were 1 million, 5 million, 20 million, whatever the number is. Uh, that's how our colleagues at Worcester Township do it. Um, that's not where we were as a district. Um, right now, the short-sightedness of previous boards has left us with little to no capital reserve and we're forced to borrow money to pay for $20,000 and $50,000 and $100,000 projects. These are the type of projects that we should be paying for annually out of capital reserves. We shouldn't be borrowing for them. Um, 
when we look at the wraparound structure of our debt, we're fully loaded out to 2025. So any substantial new debt is tacked on to the back end. And the result of that is that we're going to pay a 30 and 40% premium on every dollar that we borrow. If we stay on the current track that we're on and we're borrowing eight and a half million dollars every year, we're going to be paying back almost $12 million. That's three and a half million dollars in interest expense that perhaps we don't need to pay. Uh, we have an opportunity to help set ourselves on the right track here. Um, my problem with any kind of immediate you know, relief or rebate is that we're going to create a revenue deficit in the short term that we have to make up in the following years. We saw it a couple of years ago when a previous board pushed through a budget with a 0% tax increases, uh, excuse me, a 0% tax increase by selling the buses and using the million dollar proceeds to offset operating expenses. That is exactly what I want to avoid here. It creates a pay me now or pay me later scenario and, and ultimately our students lose. Uh, and then our taxpayers lose because we've got to increase taxes more in a, in a future year than we did in a prior year. And ultimately that creates a net defunding of our district. I think it's important that we take the opportunity we have now to honor the commitment that we made to both improve our facilities and improve the financial standing of our district. I think we take the $2 million, we set it aside in the capital reserve fund and we offset our borrowing for the coming year. Um, I'd also like to see that we start a process where we start to allocate money annually into our capital reserve fund, similar to uh, you know every year when you when you do your 401k contribution at work, you get the option to increase your uh, contribution rate year over year. That's where we need to go as a district. Um, you know, I, th I think if you consider the fact that we're that there's a potential renovation out there for. Uh, Arrowhead or a rebuilding of Arrowhead, and we're talking about adding somewhere between anywhere from 10 and $25 million to our debt load, there's even more more incentive for us to improve our debt, san debt uh, standing. So all in all, I think we just need, I think we just take the $2 million, we set aside in capital reserves, and then let's start to work on, on plans for 10 and 20 year outlooks. Um, so that we can we can start to budget for this this kind of thing in the future. I, I just want to make a, a clarification, Mr. Navarrete. Are you suggesting that we put the two million dollars in capital reserve or into the master plan committed funds? Because they're they're two different things. I just want to make sure because you said you said capital reserve. I think at the last year. Yeah, I, I don't think it matters one way or the other. If we take the capital reserve fund, then we're just going to use it later to offset master plan borrowing. I mean, it's you know it's it's moving it from one account to another later on. Well, it, it, it may be it's helpful for the board to understand the difference between the two. So when we do committed funds, like for the master plan, uh, it does allow you as a board to change your mind at some point in time, or future boards to change your mind. But if you put the money into the capital reserve, um, then it can only be used for capital expenses. So it's not like we can transfer the money out ever. And that was, you know, I just want to be clear with, with that. Yeah. I, I, okay. So I, I would say put it in the capital reserve fund because I think it's. I think we need to lock it in. We have. We're we're looking at, at what seventy million dollars remaining. Uh, yeah. Are there any other thoughts uh, on, on this particular topic? I mean, I, I, it's on the agenda for for a discussion. Um, please note that um, you know if if there are. I mean, if, if we if we don't have any you know motions and, and you know we, we would we would kind of get to a point where we end the discussion and we and we and we move on and maybe 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 there could be a, a recommendation for the finance committee to come back with a a motion uh, maybe in January to, to to deal with it. I mean, not much is going to change between now and in January. So I mean, that's that's still a possibility. I I just don't know. It doesn't sound like we have a lot of. I know there was a couple of comments from, from last week. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts. No, that's kind of what, just to reiterate my, if you look at the options here, my kind of thinking was a, a combination of several of these options. Um, one of which is, you know, leave a certain amount in the committed fund balance for the master plan. Whether that's a half million dollars or a million dollars, that could be further thought about. But the original thinking was when we passed the resolution back in May was that the number was going to be a half a million dollars, um, not two million. Um, so I'm, I'm suggesting kind of a combination of 
master plan, and then some way to structure it so that there is relief against future budgets or one-time expenses that would lead to higher levels of tax increases. Um, and there is a way, I believe, to, and I'm not suggesting offset the full $2 million against next year's tax increase, because then you get back to the scenario Mr. Navarrete alluded to from several years ago. And I think there's a way to structure tax relief that it wouldn't penalize future years dramatically where you may have zero one year and have to go, you know, hypothetically north of three if that was available, um, which I think is what we saw a couple years ago. So, I, and, and as far as allocating more money to the capital reserve, I think that's a, that would be a great option, but there's only really the, the way our finance are structured now, I only see two ways of doing that. One is you cut spending somewhere else to move money to the capital reserve, or you have a higher level of tax increase to provide additional revenues to move to the capital reserve. Um, that's really the only two options I see. I don't think either of those are very, very appealing in my view. Um, so my suggestion and thinking about this more is that I'd like to come up with a resolution. I don't know the process of getting something on the agenda if I'm the only one suggesting it, but some sort of resolution yeah, we could talk about it in the finance committee meeting in January, uh, but I'd like to have it brought to the board in, in January at the work session to discuss even further if, there's no, if there is a need for further discussion or to have this just have it voted on, we can put it to bed. So that's kind of my thinking. And I will just reiterate from my uh, comments last week, I appreciate this being brought to our attention because the bottom line is, like Dr. Zerby said, we made this resolution when we when we thought of a different number and we all know we have 80 million left to work with, or look, work, 80 million left of projects. We need to work on these facilities. But the bottom line is, when we made this resolution, we had half a million dollars in our mind, not 2.5 million. So I would back up um, Mr. Earnshaw's um, uh, suggestion of coming up with something at the Finance Committee, because I think there's a way to m lead to a middle ground. So, and and when, I th when I think about tax relief, I I'm thinking, I mean, not offsetting, because I think it's like a 2.4% tax increase generates $1.8 million, eight, roughly. Um, so even if you just devoted a half a million to going against the budget next year on a $110 million budget, I, I think you're going to find it in there, given we had a, this level of surplus. I mean, I understand there's one-time items, but I don't think, I mean, a half a million could mean a tax increase of 1.9 versus 2.4 which is meaningful. It's not, it may not seem a lot to everybody, but it, it's meaningful, it's something. So that, that's kind of what I'm thinking about, not taking the full two million offset it against it in one year. I, I'd probably throw in uh, that we are gonna have a preliminary budget in January. Um, so to, to act upon this one way or another at this point, when we could wait, in theory, another month. Um, uh, to me, I understand both points of view, um, and I, I do, f in, in my gut, feel that the, the, this was significantly more, and that a portion of this is one time off, but a portion of this is the budgetary process and not having a business manager in a year. No offense, Dr. Zerby, but the, more or less, we we did a Dr. Zerby did this budget by himself, um, and had to be uh, rightfully so. I think conservative in that approach with not being able to get to that level of detail. I think that's part of the reason that some of these as aspects ended up being uh, a little out of whack. I suspect um, that Mr. Bricker will be much tighter um, with what we see in January. I don't think uh, um, there's been any thought or any talk about uh, even looking at exceptions this year, even though last year we, we considered that. Um, at least out in my head, I don't see exceptions even being on the table. So we're probably going the south side of, act, of an Act One index um, in this budget process. So I would wait. I just want to make a comment. Uh, I, I think it, it should be known that uh, we will not be eligible for uh, for uh, exceptions. Yeah. exceptions yeah. or yeah. fees or exceptions. We're not eligible this year. Uh, 
I tend to agree with what Paul just said there in terms of the, the timing of this discussion is that this is happening just before we come up with our initial budget. So I think it is going to be helpful to see what our tax increase is for next year. I mean, Mr. Earnshaw mentioned, you know, $500,000. I have no idea what, what tax increase we're going to need, so I don't know what that 500000 would go against in the first place. Um, one of the questions I did have, though, which is kind of a follow-up from my discussion from last week was, um, in terms of the actual capital reserve and capital campaign accounts combined, we're at like five point two or five hundred twenty thousand dollars at this point. Whereas last year, according to the audit statement, it looks like we were at one point two, leading me to think that roughly about seven hundred thousand dollars has been spent on non-financed um, projects over the course of the year. Can you confirm if that's at least ballpark correct? We took $800,000 and used that to offset the refinancing of the bond, the variable rate bonds. So it did lower the amount that we borrowed on that. Okay. that. That was the capital campaign money. Okay. Yeah. So my, my concern here, and I think that if Dr. Zerby, what you said is correct, which I believe it is, that if it's sitting in the um, committed for facilities master plan that we can move funds out of there at a later time if things change, my concern is that we'll actually go through the $520,000 in the course of a year or pretty close to it. Um, and as I've said before, I mean, you look at our capital reserve account compared to um, school districts all over the place. I mean, you're going to need these things. Arrowhead modular things come up. There's going to be things that are going to come up during the year, which wasn't part of our planning process from a year before, a year and a half before. So I think the flexibility is very important there. Um, and I do want to get back to one thing which Ralph said because I'm 100% in agreement there is if we know we have all this money to spend between now and X number of years in the future to give a dollar for dollar type tax relief now um, isn't much of a tax relief for a citizen in terms of their total time in their house because to Ralph's point, you're going to pay dollar for dollar now or you're going to pay dollar plus a lot of interest moving forward because again, as Ralph mentioned, we have wraparound debt. We are fully loaded for a while. So for anyone who pays attention to our debt payments, we pay interest only on our debt. Look at the fuel project. I think it's nine, 10 years of interest only payments. We haven't paid anything down on the actual principle of that. That is a huge impact on the amount that you pay overall for a project. So I think that that needs to come into mindset. It might be great for the taxpayer next year, or if you take that over four years, that's great. But when they've now paid a super surplus for the amount of money which we know we need, I don't necessarily think that that's much of a uh, benefit for the taxpayer in the long run. So, thank you. Any other comments? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Mrs. Kanker? Um My comment is basically I, I requested that it be all written out like this so that we really can have a concrete discussion because I think you, we need to see the numbers versus just having conversation around it. So I do agree what Paul has said is we wait until that budget comes up and we look at it, review it, and this way we can, if we choose to, do like Brian is saying, put the options and mix it from either going towards the master plan project, allocating it to a one-time expense, or even providing that tax reduction. But I really would like to see what the budget looks like for the following year, knowing it's based on a 2.4 and if we have the option to reduce it to a 1.9. But I also agree with what Ralph is saying, that you know we're pay now instead of dealing with these you know, extreme 20 to 30% over the price. But um, I agree. I think we should just wait just so we can see what the budget looks like. Any level of clarity, Dr. Zerby, and just to make sure that um, I'm clear, you're saying the way that the our resolution read by putting into the master plan it gives us the flexibility in the future to move that if you choose to move it straight into the capital reserve then it is it's I know this word will be used against me locked into that particular account that, that, that is accurate so uh, committed funds uh, allow us to uncommit those funds um, but if you put it in the capital reserve you were going to sp only spend it on eligible capital projects so there's really if there's 
consensus on delaying this. There's really no action is required because we still have the flexibility in the future. To Absolutely, do we, we have the flexibility. The we can wait, you know, three years from now to make a decision on this. The money will stay there. It'll be budgeted in that category, and it will stay there until, uh, you know, uh, the board decides they they want to spend the money or, or not. Uh, so I, I really appreciate the dialogue this evening. I think um, if, if there's no objection, uh, what I'd like to do is bring this matter before the Finance Committee in January and uh, ask them to help us prepare a recommendation for a resolution that will hit the uh, agenda and be uh, uh, a voting matter for the, uh, the board to act on. Uh, so if there's no objection to that, uh, I'd like to move on to the next item. I, I just, just want to, I, gotta, I want to add, Two points. Okay. One is regarding next year's budget. Um, the November 8th presentation had a slide 27 that included an act one increase of 2.7, which I think is above where we're going to be. And that showed a deficit of a million dollars for 2020. Okay. So we kind of have a sense. I mean, January 1st, February, that's fine. I'm not I'll make concerned with that, but we kind of have a sense of what we might, might see in January with respect, with respect to the budget. Um, and then regarding the debt, I mean, I'm talking about possibly a million to a million five that would not go to capital funding. And the way that we've intentionally structured the debt and our borrowings is so that our debt service remains relatively flat year to year um, to help manage the tax increase. When we do borrow money, there's an intentional decision the way we structure that debt where it's interest only up front and principal comes later. So that's just not arbitrary that's just the way it was structured is it fair points any any other comments if not uh and there's no objection to my my statement about uh, working with the finance committee to come back with a resolution uh, we'll move forward mr president all right thank you everyone so we're moving on to the remaining fiscal items to the audit report so may i have a mo motion to approve the financial statements and single audit report as presented by Maley CPAs and reviewed by the Finance Committee of the Board as presented. Mr. Earnshaw, can I have a second? Mr. Ryan, any comments from the board? Just one comment. I'm, I'm glad to see that we have clean financials with a, an, another CPA firm. Uh, that was the purpose of, of switching auditors this year, so we had a different view. Um, it's it's uh, not, not surprising but also comforting that uh, we, we see the same thing coming from a different CPA firm and uh, what type of recommendations they come for, forward and hopefully it wasn't too much of a, a burden on the financial task this week. Any other comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, we'll start down here with Ms. Reese. Yes. 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 And the motion carries 9-0. And moving on to the master plan. Um, does anyone want to take any of the items of the master plan separately? OK. May I have a motion to approve items 1 through 5 list, as listed under the master plan as presented here this evening? Ms. Hall and second, Ms. Drummond. Any comments from the board on these five items? Mr. Navarrete? Yeah, I just wanna make a comment on number four um, about the roofs. The, um, uh, Mike, you had asked a question last week about the Skyview roof section. Uh, that was noted in the report as being part of the quote Skyola section. It was, um, it was part of the old Arc Polo building. Uh, it, but it's also listed in the roof assessment report as being constructed in 2009. But I think that's something we'll need to follow up with um, Mr. Fretz and Fidavia on. Um, in general, just a comment on how we've been approaching these roofs. Uh, I just want to note that at the high school, um, in that 2017 roof assessment report, 16 of the 28 sections of roof were rated D or F. Um, it, that means it had less than four years of remaining life, and an F roof has less than one year. Um, only six of those 28 were rated F, and all of those were addressed uh, in 2018 or will be addressed in 2019. Uh, at Arcola, 
All 23 sections of the Arcola roof were rated D or F, and 13 of them were rated F. Um, those 13 F-rated roofs represented more than 80 percent of, uh, of Arcola's uh, roof capacity. So we addressed one of those this year with the auditorium project, uh, which is nearly 20,000 square feet. It was the second largest section of F-rated roof on the building. And in 2019, we'll be replacing eight of the remaining 12 uh, F-rated roofs. So um, I'm proud of the work that the property committee and this board is doing to address the, the most serious uh, outstanding issues uh, where building envelopes are concerned. Thank you, Mr. Navarrete. Are there any other comments from the board? Mr. Ryan? Just one a clarification for the minutes that that question actually came from Mr. Winters at the prior work session, not Mr. Ryan, just so that reads correctly. Thanks. I'm sorry. That's, they look alike. I get it. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? All right, we'll take a vote starting down here with Mrs. Reese. Yes. 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 And the motion carries 9-0. Moving on to personnel items, Mr. Regina. Thank you. Uh, number of items, number of items for the board's consideration tonight. Uh, starting things off, we have uh, one item for resignation under professional. We have one item for resignation under classified. We have two items under job descriptions. One item for establishment of administrative positions. Two items for the change of status, administrative. One item for elimination of administrative positions. Two items under elimination of classified positions. Two items for employment of classified positions. Four items for the change of status of professional staff. One item for uncompensated leave for professional staff two items for uncompensated leave for classified staff, one item for sabbatical leave, one item for compensated professional development leave, seven items under supplemental contracts, and one item under volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Regina. Uh, does anyone wish to take any of these personnel items separately? Okay, seeing none, may I have a motion to approve all personnel items as presented here this evening? Ms. Reese, is there a second? Mr. Winters, comments from the board? Um, I have a couple. Um, Mr. Regina, I asked you last week about how we were covering the Dean of Students and you know, then the acting principal and you had mentioned there had already been some, substi some substitute things going on. So are there, is there an STS employee involved with that there is there's a bit of a domino effect and ultimately there is one sts employee that's employed okay. and a, a question came to me from somebody um and maybe this can be talked about in education but how are observations of sts employees handled is that a combination how of of methactin administrators or how does that we do not have a formal evaluation process internally that evaluates STS uh, employees. I would like to make a mention of discussing that at education. Um, it just, it, it's a question that came to me and I thought it was a very good question. Um, and tonight something came to my attention. There's a lot of wonderful instructional assistants that are always recognized for their wonderful work. And I would imagine that's basically building administrators who are responsible for their um, observations and things like that? Okay. And then my other question is, we're approving a state, um, a change of status, and we're approving an acting principal. And unless I missed it, which it's possible, did we approve anything for the administrator on leave, or is that not something we have to do, or did I miss something? Uh, you did not yet. We're, it's something that you'll be seeing, but we do not have the there's a medical leave that's coming, yes. Okay. I figured there had to be something. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other comments or questions from the board? Mr. Winters? Uh, yeah, if you could s just speak towards the staff leaving, and I have another question. If you have a reason that you can share. 
We, uh, for the teaching position that's leaving, we still have not scheduled, we have it scheduled an exit interview, okay. but we have not had it yet. Okay. And for the the instructional assistant, it is a, they're uh, looking to explore the substitute teaching realm now that they have their teaching certificate. Okay, thank you. Um, and there are a lot of moving parts, and I know we talked about the, the net of the ad from the supervisor of transportation position to, um, financial analyst, I'm not sure what the exact title is around here, but um, that's a net negative number on the budget. So as my understanding with these eliminations, it's, I heard that the, a couple of these positions were not in the budget. Is there anything being added here that's an, an increase to the budget outside of uh, the net? The net? No, there's no increase. It, what you essentially see is the accounts uh, specialist, the accounting specialist position is absorbing some of what those transportation duties were, both of the supervisor and of the trans transportation secretary. Um, that's already been built into the budget. That position was already there. I want to believe it was a Barb Sharkey. Is that Tim? You might be able to answer. That's that. correct. Okay. So it's a net net savings with these uh, moving up parts. That's okay. correct. All right. Thank you. Would you be able to provide more detail on O sabbatical leave, please? Yes, yeah, so the, the way we have our sabbatical leave structured in the districts is, is we, by code, sabbatical leave is defined by professional development leave or by a medical leave. In the district, we separate those by policy. So we list, when we write sabbatical leave, it is under medical leave. Our compensated, I have to look at it just to make sure I say it right, compensated professional development leave, is that still of sabbatical leave? We just name it differently here in the district. So it, it falls under the same category, but allows us to kind of differentiate which one's medical and which one's educational. You're welcome. I have one more quick question I forgot. We um, accepted the resignation last month of an aquatics director. Has there been any movement on a new aquatics director? No, there's, it, there's no movement at the time. Sorry, also I had one more that I forgot. Um, the, 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 the domino effect with the acting principal at Eagleville and the dean of students uh, acting as similar to assistant principal at the high school. We also added a counselor this year, I think, in the high school. Uh, not added, but we replaced, uh, there was a new counselor in the high school this year. So now that we have two new counselors at the high school, including one that's an STS employee, is that the net effect of this? It, in, in a sense, so we had a leave in the beginning of the year for a counselor. Um, that counselor has returned. We had a transition plan for that counselor because they were moving from Skyview to the high school as a new counselor. In the meantime, another counselor has moved to a position of dean of students. So the people that we were using to fulfill that counselor responsibility in the beginning of the year has transitioned still in that same office, but in a different actual counseling position. Does that, okay. that make yeah, sense? Yeah, so are we um, counseling short in the high school, I guess is my next We are not, we, we are not short. We are right where we need to be. Last chance. Any other questions for Mr. Regina? Yeah, Kim. <clears throat> Can you guys comment on uh, with Dr. Zerbe or, or Jake? We've you've got stipends listed here for all these positions. Can you comment on the additional duties uh, that justify those stipends and how you came up with the numbers that are there to justify that a stipend is needed? Certainly. The, the first stipend uh, for the Eagleville principal position, um, that's a natural increase in responsibilities from an assistant principal to a principal. This has been a pattern. The district has followed a practice they have followed, I believe it was in 1415, and then again in 1516 with an assistant principal. I believe it was John Smink uh, who had gone to a principal role, and we had looked at a monthly stipend of $800. So we have maintained that consistent approach with the increased responsibilities in that position. The teacher um, on assignment that's going to be fulfilling the dean of students role has a stipend of $300 a month. Um, that both is an increase in responsibilities, but also an increase in time. So we have that person um, beyond their contractual day coming extra time daily and also attending nighttime activities to be able to uh, fulfill some of the role needed by a dean of students. Um, essentially fulfilling the assistant principal role in a sense 
um, but focusing more on disciplinary measures, not getting into evaluating teachers since that person is still a member of the bargaining unit. Is the uh, the eight hundred dollars um, where does that where does that come from? Because if I look at if I look at the salaries of all of our administrators, um, certainly there are elementary school principals that are making less than that. I mean, eight hundred dollars equivalent to a ten thousand dollar a year raise. Now, I understand she won't be in that may not be in that position for a year, um, but do do you know where the eight hundred dollars actually comes from, other than we did it before? I did, if you would like me to try to quantify what exact responsibilities the principal would have different than the assistant principal, I could attempt to do that. It might be difficult to, to come up with. No, now I, I guess my, it, my question, I'm just concerned that we're, we're handing out stipends for um, position changes when they may not be warranted. We did it last year when um, we uh, when, when Arthic took over the director duties and there was a very significant change in salary relative to what he was making versus what the director position was. It was understandable. Uh, I just, I don't see that difference here. Um, I'm just concerned about the precedent that we're setting. Yeah, uh, if I could just interject here, I, I think it's important to, to recognize that in this particular case um, and, and, in, and in even previous uh, cases, uh, the individual that's taking on the principal role here is also maintaining several of the uh, administrative uh, functions in terms of their role in the high school. So uh, the, um, I know it's, she's taking care of testing uh, among a number of other items. That's great. And so, and so what, you're, what you're finding here is she's not only taking on the responsibilities as a principal from an assistant principal, but she's retaining some of the things that we can't really hand off to uh, this um, dean of students. Because and, and no one else in the high school has the experience uh, to run these particular programs. So she, she's, in, in all essence, doing double duty. So honestly, this is probably, in, in all fairness, probably not, n not, not fair to her. But, but it, is a, it, it is, and the reason it's 800 is because, it, and it's only 800, is because it's been consistently that way. Um, okay, so, thanks. That, so, that's the explanation then that I was looking for, that, that uh, at least she's maintaining duties at the high school too. Okay, great. Thank you. I have just one quick, sorry, last one comment. All right, for K, change of status professional for four, we have um, Nicole Starson for special education. She's going on assignment. And then under M, we have another special education instructor in our COLA for leave of absence. I'm just bringing this up for, for concern of when we look at long-term subs taking those positions for special ed, that's a, a big change for that, you know, that group of children. So I just really want to, it's two teachers at the same time. We're, we're actually blessed with one of them because we had a long-term sub that was fulfilling a role that just ended and is transitioning immediately into one of those roles. So we're fortunate for that. Um, but we, we do have another individual going in for the Starson position, but it will be a new person to the district. So we recognize that is a bit of a hardship there at the building. Thank you. All right, I was gonna see if we could pause on the vote with Mr. Winters stepping out, but um, I will just continue on. So we have a motion to approve the personnel items. We've all asked Mr. Regina 101 questions. All those in favor, starting down here with Ms. Reese. Yes. 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 Okay, and the motion carries eight to zero. If I could, I just want to introduce our acting principal uh, at Eagleville Elementary School, Dr. Kokenauer. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. And now we're on to curriculum and programs. Dr. Katona. Thank you. Uh, this evening, for your approval, we have the comprehensive plan as presented. Um, for July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2022. And uh, 
the, resol the e-signature resolution as outlined in the uh, document to grant authority to the superintendent to electronically sign all e-grants available to Methacton School District um, through basically through the PDE e-grant website. Okay, thank you, Dr. Katona. May I have a motion to approve the 2019 through 2022 comprehensive plan and resolution 18-07 e-signature as presented? Mr. Ryan, is there a second? Mr. Earnshaw, any comments from the board on either item? Mr. Ryan? Just a quick question. I know that there was an email that came through late in the day. Could you just go over any of the um, changes that were made to the comprehensive plan? Thank you. Yes, um, so we had uh, just a couple of comments, uh, feedback on the comprehensive plan and reviewed them and in reviewing them found that there was nothing substantial that needed to be corrected or updated in the comprehensive plan. It did, however, have us reflecting a little bit on some of the verbiage um, in the plan and wanted to make sure that we were clear in a couple of the areas. So um, on page 19, uh, where we had been talking about the types of practices that are used uh, for instruction. Uh, we had said we were regularly focused on reviewing data that can inform instruction. And I added in that that includes, but is not limited to reviewing local assessment data, benchmark data, state assessments, and PVOS scores. And then I went on, to, I had gone on previously to say in this way, we ensure these best practices are occurring in ways that are best meeting the needs of our students. And I added to that, additionally, we continue to work on improving our practices in differentiating instruction. Um, and then the other item that I just wanted to add clarification to on page 10, and this did not actually come out of the comments, um, but this is because of um, what we've learned from Monco uh, regarding our dual enrollment, that they will not have the macro and microeconomics being offered next year. And so um, originally I had said that students may take economics courses through a dual enrollment pro uh, program in conjunction with the community college. I simply added when offered, they may do that. And so those are the only two updates. Um, and the comprehensive plan will, as, as it is posted now with the agenda, will be submitted in that way with the special ed plan embedded in it as well, um, which had already been approved last spring. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Okay, start with Ms. Reese. Yes. 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 And that motion carries 9-0. Moving on to policy, Dr. Zerbe. Thank you. There are five policies for first reading, but for action this evening, there are 11 policies uh, for your approval. Policy 004, membership, 008, organization, 218.2, terroristic threat, 210, medications, 227, controlled substance, 313, evaluation of employees, 325, dress and grooming, 326, complaint process, 334, sick leave, 336, personal necessity leave, and 342, jury duty. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. May I have a motion to approve the second reading policies as presented? Ms. Hull, a second. Ms. Cancrow, any comments from the board? Seeing none, we'll start down here with Ms. Reese. Yes. 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 And that motion carries 9-0. Uh, other, Dr. Zerby. Thank you. Under gifts and donations, uh, we have accept a gift of $3,200 from the Methacton Education Foundation to be used for fulfillment of a grant uh, for the Methacton uh, High School Marching Band to offset the cost of a trip to the Liberty Bowl. The second one is a gift of $450 from the Methacton Education Foundation to be used for fulfillment of the uh, Science Teachers membership into Montgomery County Science Teachers Association. Uh, next, under trips, we have approved a trip for the Methacton High School baseball team to Orlando, Florida, April 16th through the 20th, no cost to the district. The second item, approve a trip for the Methacton High School girls uh, varsity track and field to Staten Island on December 15th and 16th, cost to the district $275. Third, approve the trip to Methacton High School girls basketball 
team to Wildwood, New Jersey, December 29th and 30th. The cost of the district is $300. Four, approve a trip for Methacton Girls Varsity Track and Field to State College, January 4th through the 5th. Cost of the district is $300. And last, approve a trip for Methacton High School Girls Varsity Track and Field to Staten Island uh, on January 26th and 27th. 2019 cost of the district $275. And the last on that, that section is the 2018-19 superintendent goals. Approved the goals as presented uh, for the superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. May I have a motion to approve the gifts as presented? Ms. Reese, and a second. Ms. Drummond, any comments? Starting down here with Ms. Reese. Yes. 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 And that motion carries 9-0. May I have a motion to approve the trips as presented this evening? Ms. Reese, is there a second? Mr. Earnshaw, are there any comments from the board? Starting down here with Ms. Reese. Yes. 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 Motion carries 9-0. And now onto the superintendent goals. May I have a motion to approve the superintendent's goals for the 2018-2019 school year as presented? Ms. Reese, is there a second? Ms. Drummond, any comments from the board? Okay, I would just like to um, request that these get posted to the website in the way that, that we have in yep, years past. I know do. that we do have a little bit of a gap in there, but we can address it going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, we'll start down here with Ms. Reese again. Yes. 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 The motion carries 9-0. Uh, dates for board members' calendars. We have a reorganization meeting and a regular board meeting coming up on December 3rd, and property and transportation is meeting December 10th. Is there any old business here this evening? Nothing really old, but just to add to your dates, everyone don't forget about the North Montgomery Technical Career Center holiday dinner. I know we're all busy, but we have a few less meetings in December. I'm not bringing a plus one, but if anybody at the table would like to join me, it would be a pleasure. And we can possibly fruit uh, the benefits of the of the culinary um, teacher that won that national award. Thank you, Ms. Reese. Is there any new business? All right. And at this point, we'll open it up to courtesy of the floor. Mr. Andrews. John Andrews, Law of Providence. Uh, earlier today, I submitted to Methacton three documents bearing on the Arrowhead renovation option. Ideally, they can be on a public website and not lost on directors' always busy plates. Speaking of financial issues, Methacton has lots of existing debt. Serving it loads our budget to the tune of 10% per year. Methacton has to borrow $8 million per year for renovations about the rate of payoff of existing debt over the next nine or so years. We don't have a sugar daddy to help out. Chances of a recession in a year are rising. Interest rates will rise with or without it. Births will stay low, under 270, not, wrong, not the wrong 320 of M&M's base case. Aside from that, enrollment should rise somewhat with new homes. Audubon closure is but a short-term fix if enrollment rises. What then? The 500 planned new homes may increase enrollment, but not a lot. We have enough empty rooms to consider several alternatives to keeping the Arrowhead school. A new Arrowhead would be nice. We don't need it. It would cause a referendum mandated by extra annual interest. It would fail. Then what? Empty rooms at Skyview and Arcola will stay empty under any two grades per school option there. My K-5 option, educate students, solves our needs. We must study it further. 
it seems savvy and experienced residents speaking here are ignored or cut off when they offer concerns or suggestions. The superintendent seems reluctant to speak his mind, at least in public, lest he be blamed for losing someone's re-election bid. To this point, he spoke of 36 excess teachers and got a yawn from last year's board. The board would be smart to convene a community committee on facility issues to get community consensus. Full day kindergarten is impossible until we get our finances in much better shape. Our education gets high scores without it. Lastly, emotion won't cure our financial, financial issues or get directors reelected. Go home and think about what you hear tonight. Thank you. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Ms. Teed. Marilyn Teed, Worcester. On uh, October 26th, I received a letter from Mr. Zerby. And if you go on my uh, YouTube channel, uh, Marilyn Spirit Level, you can see it in total. And uh, I have it, I read it on the, on the uh, video. So um, in the letter, it says that lack of compliance with the policies of the district, uh, and this was concerning my behavior at the homecoming football game. So um, I sent him an email October 26th, and then another one. And then, oh wait, oh no, that was like an October 26th letter. November 1st, October 30th, November 1st, November 14th, and then today, and, or no, yesterday. And then today I get a response. When all those four times I requested the information as to what policy was he talking about, and then he eliminates, he does the forward, or the reply thing, and then eliminates all those two, three, and four, and goes right back to number one when I asked it. And uh, so I think he was a little disingenuous there with that. And then I looked up policy 913. So the only thing I can see on policy 913 is the board prohibits distribution and posting of non school materials by any non-school organization, group, or individual. Okay, first off, I didn't post anything, but I did have a card which I gave all of you at the last meeting. So, um, if they were following, if the, the staff was following school policy, the only thing they should have said to me was, you can't hand out anything. But instead, I was harassed and people were directed away from me down the hill to the other gate down below. And they were pushing me and grabbing my, my banners. And uh, it was, it was uh, quite a scene. And um, so they were not following school policy. They were just harassing me. So if there's nothing to this, if there's nothing to the flat earth, then why is there such a frenzy over me not allowing this to be heard. Why is that? My First Amendment rights protect me. I can say that. I was not inside the event at all. I was just standing there saying, all the oceans are flat with each other. So I offered to have a debate with everyone, whoever. Why don't we get all this information out on the table? You know, there's two ways to run a race. You can be honorable and you can beat the other guy fair and square. Or you can find ways to obstruct the other person. You can throw things in their path. You can disrespect them. You can mock them. But that's not an honorable way, is it? I think we ought to teach our students to be honorable. Let's get all this information out on the table. Let's have a debate. Let me bring all this information to you and see who's telling the truth. That's what I would like to see happen. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Mr. Bickelman? Uh, 
Uh, Brian Reagan from Collegeville. Um, it's not actually what I even came for tonight, but I did just want to comment on any um, surplus that you have. I think when I look around the district and I look at the average age of our buildings and I look at all the fun projects that you already have and all the ones that will come beyond, any notion of sending me a, a minimal amount of tax relief, I think will ultimately I'll pay way more than that at the end of the day. And I think that the amount we spend on our schools and the amount we spend on our children will re reflect in our property values and will more than make that money back. So I would really strongly encourage you, whether it's master plan or whether it's fund balance, that's not my expertise to determine, but I would hope that we would listen to the leaders of the district and really put it where they think it is best. But in terms of the reason I actually came, which is about the Arrowhead project, I do have two children there. Um, in addition to paying a taxpayer, and I'm interested on both fronts. I realize it's not really the item on the agenda today, so I'm not really looking to push that at 9.30 at night. But what I am wondering is, I came tonight because I thought that might be what this meeting was about, because there was a lot of information out in the community about what is going on. So what I really want to know is what is the schedule for that? When will that be talked about? When is the appropriate time for me to come so that I make sure that I, I really do genuinely want to be a part of that process? And I want to make sure that other parents like me and other taxpayers like me have the ability to be a part of that process. I don't envy your jobs, nor do I in any way want one. Um, but I would like to know and I really do genuinely appreciate the service that you guys put in. I do know the hours that you guys do. Um, but I would like to know like, how we can be a part of that and how that will be communicated at, to make sure that we know what meetings we do need to be at. Okay, um, Mr. Reagan, I don't want to cut you off if you're no. not finished, but I do want to respond just because it, you were asking. Um, so it's an ongoing process. We, we don't have a specific timeline of, a, of agendas, um, but the agenda for each meeting is posted um, approximately three days in advance of the meeting, so our meetings are on Tuesdays. It's usually on Saturday night that the agenda goes live on the website, so you can always see in advance of a board meeting whether or not it's a topic. And we have been making an effort to communicate out to the public as much as we can um, when we think that there is a critical Right, and I don't mean to point. insult that effort. My only concern with the agenda, like when I, and I know a little bit about board agendas. But like, so when I read that agenda, there's all sorts of ways that Arrowhead could have been part of that discussion, depending on how you want to interpret that item. And I'm not trying to in any way imply anybody was being deceptive. I'm saying as a general member of the public, when I read certain financial reports or certain strategic plan or certain other things, building projects could be a part of that discussion. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't not here if that was part of it. So I just want to make sure that I think it's a, an enormously important issue what you choose to do with that building, whether it is a redistricting or as I would prefer a new building or even a renovation, although I think that would be a bit of a boondoggle probably ultimately at the end of the day. But I wanna make sure that everybody has the opportunity to have that and I in particular wanna make sure that I'm a part of that conversation. So I just wanna make sure that when, those, when it is definitely gonna be on the agenda, if there's a way we could really make sure that people know, I realize there are two sides of this issue and not everyone is going to agree with me, but I wanna make sure that I know to be in the right place at the right time. That's my concern. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Mr. Bickelman. Joe Bickelman from Audubon. I just want to uh, thank Mary Hull for uh, stating that the uh, people that don't have uh, kids in the district should receive a hard copy of what's going on in the district because they do pay their taxes. Uh, the only hard copy information I get about the school district is, is the tax bill that comes in the mail, and I get campaign uh, flyers. Those are the only two things I get in the mail about the school district. Uh, try putting your tax bills on your website, and don't say anything to anybody, and then see how your cash flow goes. All right? So try that. Uh, but. We should get a report on what's going on in the district. Um, the foundation does a great job. I don't know the breakdown of this check. I'd like to know the breakdown, what went to dues. But every once in a while, I sit here, and I hear things about the district where the district uh, doesn't pay for local dues for these subject areas like science, English, math, things like that. I think the board should support those memberships uh, for professional development purposes. I think it does. Uh, wonders for collaboration for these teachers. It does wonders for uh, morale. I think, you know, if it's not a bargaining chip at the table with the MEA, you know, I was disappointed to hear that this is paying for their local membership dues. 
you know, I'm a proponent of local and state memberships. I'm not too big on national memberships with the conventions in Vegas and things, but I think in the state and the local, I think it's something that should be supported by the board. Uh, the 1718 mileage for Dr. Zerbe, you should try to get that in in June. It shouldn't become a, a winter break a holiday club, you know, for your, you know, savings account. It should go in the right year uh, for your mileage. Uh, I would put the fund balance in the capital reserve account. You're always going to have a surplus, hopefully, the way this Cracker Jack business manager works. Um, you're always going to have a million, you know, 700,000, 500,000. And I think you should put it in capital reserve for unexpected items because, you know, if you close Arrowhead, you might have to build a playground at the Skyview uh, site. Uh, the high school principal, uh, Dr. Landis, went from the high school principal down to uh, assistant principal at Skyview Elementary. Uh, was there like a negative stipend there? Uh, I don't know what your past practice was on that. Was she still making her high school salary, you know, for the accountability, know-how, and responsibility at that high school, going to an assistant elementary school principal? Did she get a reduction in salary? I mean, I like her. I see her present. I, you know, I have nothing against her, but you know, you talk about past practice and getting an additional $800 for more duties. You know, what happened in the other direction? Was that something that was adjusted? I never heard anything about that. Uh, the other thing, uh, Dr. Kochenauer? You're a doctor? I am a doctor, yes. I'm sorry to see that your name in here didn't include a doctor, because I know all the work and dedication goes into that. So maybe in the, you might want to circulate the agenda amongst the cabinet so that they can get the proper designation for Dr. Kochenauer because she deserves that respect, I'm sure. And uh, the last thing with uh, uh, Dr. Navarrete over there, Max Hedrum, I was just sitting up here and I'm going like, I would love to see everyone on a laptop one meeting. I think that would be great, you know, just to see all the board members on a, on a laptop. I mean, that would just be you know, something to see, but there might come a time when that might happen, and you know, that would be interesting to see from this standpoint back here in the audience. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bickelman. Dr. Malik. <laughs> Jim Malik, Worcester. Um, it's nice to see you do, you do do back and forth with people. Maybe I should be an arrowhead person. Yeah, do, you do a back and forth answer question. That's pretty interesting to see. First time I've seen that in a while. Um, does anybody up here uh, double pay their mortgage? You know, you get your mortgage payment, and then you also throw another extra check in with your extra money for principal or interest payments? Anybody up here do that? Dr. You, Malik, that's a rather personal question. Can we just well, carry on, please? Uh, it looks like Jen does. Um, it's not a personal question, uh, because that's what you're suggesting We, you guys do up front. You're suggesting basically you do the same thing up front. You know, basically throw in your extra money for like double paying the mortgage. I don't know anybody who does double mortgage payments. <laughs> so, you know, you guys are hypocrites. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Navarrete talked about Worcester Township and how they do things because they got, you know, this excess money in their capital account. Yeah, they got nine million bucks in their capital account. You know why? Because they've been overtaxing the people, us people in Worcester with their half of 1% earned income tax. That's how you get $9 million in your capital reserve. So we're overtaxed here, and we're overtaxed in Worcester. So thanks for making that point, Ralph. You know, we're getting it both ways in Worcester. So we appreciate the overtaxation. Um, at the uh, special meeting, you made this statement. Uh, you said you cannot support closure and realignment because you said you can't support any, support any scenario that leaves three elementary schools. That's what you said. Your mind's made up. You haven't heard anything about the facts. You haven't heard anything, comments from the public. 
Because remember, you did the courtesy of the floor, then you did your questions after that, and you haven't heard any presentation from Eminem, and your mind is made up. See, I couldn't say all this because courtesy of the floor was done already. Your mind's made up already. But you have a fiduciary responsibility to hear all the facts before you make up your mind. Now, how is that? Because you made your little speech to all your Harrowhead people. You're trying to make them happy, I think. But your mind's made up already. You, Mr. Navarrete, totally wrong. Then you stated you looked at 500 houses being built. Common sense told you 10% of those families have kids and you'd be potentially looking at a lack of space in, your, in the schools. How do you come up with that? Then you said you're, you're not a gambling woman, but you're gambling with the whole thing by saying that you're not going to support closure and realignment. Because really, if you really didn't want to gamble, what you do is you close and realign and wait to see if the enrollment came around. You'd close, realign, and then keep the building and, and wait and see if the enrollment came around. So you really don't mean what you're saying because you're gambling with the whole thing. You see what I'm saying? You don't mean what you're saying. You're just talking. It's all political. The whole thing is political. So I don't know where you're making these statements. doesn't make any sense. Now, you made a comment about the right to know request. I've seen this all before. Jim Van Horn in Skyview, one, he was the one who focused on all my right to know requests. Dr. Malik, please wrap up. Right. When I was hitting home with the enrollment in Skyview one, Jim Van Horn was the one who focused in on my right to know requests. So if I were you, I wouldn't start looking at my right to know requests because it's all the same thing all over. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Motion to adjourn. Mr. Ryan, Ms. Hall, meeting adjourned.